Yes. Good evening, everyone. So welcome to the ISM SICS mega debate. And we also have a very star-studded galaxy of international faculty along with us here, who will be introduced by Dr. Amulya Sahusar very soon. So here, the title of this mega debate is, it's not just the nation, but the whole planet wants to know. So we have chosen a very hot, controversial, debatable topics, which will be uh, debated by our eminent speakers uh, in a nice way, in a smooth way, in a healthier way. Uh, I'm sure about it. And uh, I'm not trying to act here like Arnab Goswami, because although he is one of my, I, I'm, I'm just one of his fan of Arnab, and that is where the title, it's not just the nation, but the whole planet wants to know of, of on these topics. So without wasting much time, uh, I'll, I'll quickly ask our founder chairman of ISM SICS Society, Dr. Amul Sahu, sir, to please introduce our first speaker, Dr. Abhay Vasavada. I think Abhay, good. We have grown up with, with Abhay. Welcome, Abhay. Thank you. Thank you. He is one of our torch bearers and uh, always an inspiring figure in Indian ophthalmology. And we have, uh, he, he is uh, such a scientific brain. We always look to few points from him and try to uh, improve our skill. So, welcome, Abhay, and we want to benefit from Thank your you. presence. Thank you. And Dr. Boramani, sir, you want to just start open it? Yeah, our first speaker is Dr. Abhay Vasada. Uh, Dr. Abhay Vasada doesn't need any introduction. He is a world-renowned eye surgeon and a great researcher. He is from Ahmedabad, India. Dr. Abhay Vasada's introduction, if I want to tell the details, it will take almost two hours. So I'll just say two, three lines about him. He has been awarded Binkos gold medal lecture at ASCRS in 2011. He was also awarded the doctorate by Hungarian University. He has more than 200 presentations to his credit and he is a PhD guide a PhD guide for uh, at three major universities. With this short introduction, I request Dr. Abhay Vasada to start his talk on cataract surgery made for you. Over to Dr. Abhay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, ISM SICS Society and Dr. Amulya Sahu, founder chairman and all my friends. It's such a pleasure to really share my views on this cataract surgery. This is my financial disclosure. Uh, cataract surgery made for you. I've been talking about it from a patient's perspective that with improved precision and predictability and the preoperative outcome and performance, improved outcome of whatever the cataract surgery you're doing, we are able to do that. We have improved uh, IOL power calculations and different technologies helping us. And the best part is that there are so many options of IOL to suit the patient's lifestyle and his requirements. So I think that has been sorted out very well. But the question is, what about us, the surgeon? Do we really need to customize every time we have the uh, different kinds of situation here? So that's what uh, is the interest of uh, next few minutes for me. Uh, I'm not able to uh, move my presentation here somehow. Uh, you need to start sharing your screen, sir. No, it's already shared. Already uh, Dr. Abhay, sir, please click on that slide and then press the arrow button. Yeah, OK. Yes. So, uh, right, thank you. I think there are many opinions, and uh, I think I believe that SICS is the best in many, many situations, and so is the FACO emulsification in many, many situations. And some very few, though, believe that uh, many other uh, newer uh, tricks like FAMPLEX or, or uh, ZEPTO, REXIS assisted or capsulase, and many other tricks to divide the nucleus are, are really the best. So there are the best part is that we have many options to, to suit. So what is that I should choose? What is this right kind of technique in terms of surgical performance for me 
to adapt and excel. And that really will depend who am I, what is my experience, where I'm practicing, and do I have that curiosity in mind to excel and evolve and refine and so on. But keep in mind, every technique, every method has its own advantages and it also comes with some baggage and some disadvantages. But uh, the philosophy of practice that you are involved in, in terms of the, particularly for international ophthalmology, is that are you into a community service? In other words, are you into an organization or institute where you really are loaded with, with a number of patients and your primary objective is to really cope with that load with balancing the economics of the geography you're practicing? remains one consideration. Are you in a solo or a group practice, which is a some kind of a money making uh, uh, situation? And do you want to continue to stay ahead uh, of the time and of the curve of the refinement uh, in this cataract management? Uh, you need to also consider uh, what kind of these top class cataract modality, surgery modality that we have, depending upon the, uh, the environment in the eye, like shallow chamber, bad corneas, the types of cataracts and associated comorbidity. I think it's very common sense that we would do that. But I want to tell you why I chose FACO emulsification at the time when I chose it. At that time, I started with extracatural surgery, large incision, and then changed and evolved into the manual SICS at that time, in late 80s. And then at that time, SICS, when FACO emulsification was introduced to me in 1990, uh, it wasn't, it didn't appear as refined as it is today. And, and uh, I believe SICS took a much longer time to evolve and it should not have taken. And there are reasons why it took longer time, but if I had that SICS uh, progressing at the pace, the FACO emulsification, perhaps I could have been a SICS specialist today. And therefore I could never master the SICS at the time of my career and my change. And I, I continued evolving with FACO emulsification. FACO emulsification, like the modern MSICS today in 2020, has the same advantage of the closed chamber technique, little more than the SICS, but practically the same, and has the ability to titrate the capsule rex opening depending upon the size of the bulk of the cataract and, and some other issues associated with little more technology dependent than the skill dependent. And uh, there is a debate whether it is more protective to endothelium uh, or not. But the fact is that uh, uh, the modern SICS is almost, if not quite equal to FACO in all these criteria and many others because of the evolution that has occurred in last few years in the recent time. I and many few of others, not many, decided to move on to FLEX as well uh, because of certain advantages uh, in a routine cataract, but particularly in some kinds of difficult cataracts, as we discovered that our rate was uh, lower with this kind of uh, approach uh, from uh, eight or nine percent with inside out delineation, the manual technique with this kind. And also we've discovered recently that the shallow chambers had a clearer corneas and less impact in the first one or two weeks, although at the end of a month, uh, everything was comparable uh, and so on. But, but the, the few of the videos you see now, you can produce the same with your hands in MSCS or, or in a femto or, or, the, or, the, or the zepto or capsulase and many other things. So I think now we have a, a many options of creating rexes where it was not possible consistently to achieve that every time. Uh, and, and then 
uh, in a very unique situation also, you have an option of creating the axis of your side at the location you want to do. So I think the, 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 the other options of this modern extracapsular surgery of the FACO versus MSICS in 2020 today, I don't think there is a great difference in actual performance and an almost uh, comparable outcome with some one or two small uh, caveats, but, but it, it's not that great. And, and now, uh, because we learned over the years how to customize the outcome for an individual person, uh, we have mastered and uh, pre-operative evaluation to, to almost perfection. We have a lot of precision in the technology and in the performance so that we are able to produce predictable the outcome even with MSICS today. So made for you customization uh, is very much possible to make the patient happy with this MSICS as well. My only concern now here, if I'm a FACO surgeon and if I have a struggle, and that depends on what stage of the cataract removal I have a struggle, should I convert to SICS or, or a large incision extracapsular surgery, I would caution you to, to jump into it uh, and question yourself some of these because uh, uh, you can make the damage more if you're not very proficient in the, uh, the technique that you are going to change or if you have not understood the management of the vitreous, which is the common reason uh, that you need to convert it. So if you are very proficient in, in the technique that you're going to convert to uh, large incision extracapsular surgery or uh, the modern uh, MSICS is fine. But remember the key uh, to decide the fate of the eye is the how you manage and understand the vitreous management. So I would suggest that there is a very good option called bye-bye technique. In other words, let your colleagues, and in the modern time, it's very important that we manage our cataracts, co-manage with our other specialists in our setup. If you have own setup or other colleagues, and you may have to refer them uh, in the evening or the next day or whenever it's possible. But, but that probably in many, many situations will be less harmful to the eye in the longer run than, than having that issue of, of, uh, of, of removing that nucleus. Remember when there's a PCR and vitreous prolapse or vitreous coming out, our aim is not to remove that sinking nucleus material uh, and anyhow with scaffold or whatever the technique, but our main aim should be, I believe, is to prevent an acute intraoperative vitreoretinal traction and damage. So with that in context, I would consider, I would urge you to consider bye-bye technique if you are, if you don't fall into those two categories. Uh, now, when you decide to have a technique and, and that's perception of the patient, but also perception of the, your team, you can, you can make a case for SIC, SFAC, or flex, whatever, on a scientific merits and on your experience and judgment and, and meet with this dilemma of this, is it going to be experimental? Is it really good or is it just because of this so-called lasers, robotic and, and making money and so on? So I think appropriate understanding, conviction of the conception and perception of the teamwork and the patient is the key to decide which made for you will be your technique. But remember, we all understand that the real problem is this money. And now in the COVID area, and I'm, I'm, we are looking forward for these presentations, it's going to be even more relevant that the economy, global economy is now sinking. We need to be very conscious and realistic about what you adapt and make for your technique. So I think uh, having understood that modern uh, 2020 options of uh, manual small incision cataract surgery, uh, FACO emulsification, the, the other modalities of Rex's uh, generation of uh, flags and other techniques are, are, 
are very good or comparable, master the technique you feel is the best suited to you in your geography, the way you, you have a strategy of your practice and your patients, and accept and tell this patient counseling. Counseling is very important and tell the patient correctly, is it really safe? Do you believe it's going to produce, is more precise in your plan and your situation in your cataract in your, in your environment? And, and be open-minded when you're confronted with the questions or discussion with the patient and be honest to the patient, be ethical uh, to the patient and your team. So thank you for uh, uh, patient hearing uh, on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhay, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, presentation where you were very clear and you are telling which one to choose, which, which best suits the surgeon and the patient. So we have our eminent uh, panelist here with us, Dr. Boni Anderson. Dr. Amule, sir, you want to introduce Dr. Boni, please? Yes. Uh, Boni, everybody knows in India, I think she has been a friend of our ISMS ICS for a very long time. And she is the past president of ASCRS, a wonderful human being and educator per excellence. And she has been conducting regularly the SICS uh, courses in uh, America and ASCRS. I have been a part of her course also. Uh, it's a pleasure always to meet her and uh, listen to her. So welcome, Boni, to this uh, thank illustrious you. gathering. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amelia, and thank you for your vision of creating ISMICS. I think it's such an important mission around the world. So it's an honor to be with you all. And uh, and thank you, Dr. Abe Vasavada. Fantastic lecture as always. And I, you know, I with a lot of your points, always agree with you because you're such a wise man. So I think it's always a good idea to agree with Dr. Abe on all matters. Um, but specifically, I think I just want to reiterate his point that, you know, I, I'm a FACO surgeon and I'm a novice SICS surgeon and I learn from all of you. So, I mean, it's almost silly for me to be a panelist. I'm really here to learn from you all. But I think the point that I just want to reiterate is that as a surgeon, we need lots of tools. Not one tool is right for every case. So similarly, the FACO technique or, or manual small incision technique, I think every cataract surgeon should really learn all these techniques, no matter what you do on a daily basis or what country you live in, because cases arise where one technique is better. So similar to an IA tip, you know, a slightly curved tip is not useful all the time. Sometimes you need a 45 degree angle tip or a 90 degree so, you know, I really think it's important to learn. So thank you for an excellent presentation and I look forward to learning more from all of you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you. Uh, any panelists want to add or we'll go to the next one because we'll have a lot of time at the end for the panel discussion. Uh, next, uh, I think we'll move on with our first debate, right? So uh, a very nice saying I would like to quote here is for good ideas and true innovation, you need human interaction, conflict, argument, and debate. And that is why we have the debate here today. The first debate is going to be on the carbon footprint in OR. That is, we need to reuse and recycle, will be uh, spoken by Dr. Madhu Uddaraju. Dr. Madhu Uddaraju is a director of uh, Sri Kiran Eye Institute in Kakinada. He's a cornea and refractive surgeon trained at Arvind Eye Institute and uh, medical uh, director of uh, Balakrishna uh, Center uh, of uh, uh, Eye Donation and Eye Foundation. So with this, uh, uh, we have his opponent, a fearful opponent who is uh, very well known now uh, because of his uh, life beyond ophthalmology. Uh, he has been conducting it very well. He is the member ARC of North Zone, Chairman Scientific Committee of Rajasthan Ophthalmic Society and director uh, for Rawat and Eye and FACO Surgery and Jaipur. Uh, laser vision center. So we'll go with our first topic, uh, which is a, a very important topic. So why we have chosen this is we all know that destruction of the environment is one of the most uh, significant challenges of our century and medical industry plays no small role. In, in fact, in a study done in United States, healthcare sector is responsible for 10% of the country's total greenhouse gas emissions, 10% of its smog formation, and 9% of its ozone depletion. And even in a study done in United Kingdom, uh, says that 
performing the surgery, that is uh, one FACO surgery is equivalent of driving an automobile for nearly 400 miles. So let us see whether we need to go with the reusable and recyclable or it is just sterility is of utmost importance and disposable is the way to go. So I now call upon our first speaker on the debate, Dr. Madhu Uddaraju, to uh, speak for reusable and recyclable. Dr. Madhu. Madhu, your time starts now. Six minutes. Yes, sir. A very good evening to all of you. I firstly thank ISMICS and uh, especially Srinivas Joshi sir for giving me this golden opportunity. And I think if our next generation has to look at scenes like this, we all need to be aware of our carbon footprint and uh, there is no other way but to reuse and recycle. So the scope of this talk would be under the following headings how we felt inspired to do this study, why we need to do it, a small review of literature, we'll share our experience and how we changed after knowing the impact. So the inspiration of course is our alma mater, Arvin. You know that uh, recycling and reusing and being cost effective is in the DNA of Arvin. Being trained there, we were all very used to doing this kind of practices. However, it was Dr. D.S. Morris from Cardiff hospital from the London who did his first study on carbon footprint in 2013 and followed by Dr. Venkatesh from Arvind Pondicherry and Cassandra who compared the carbon footprint of cataract surgery from India to the Western world. So why we need to be more aware? We all know that cataract surgery is the most commonly performed surgery in the world. And as Srinivas sir was telling, when we did our study, uh, doing one FACO surgery in, in India was almost driving a car for 45 kilometers and doing one SACS surgery was driving a car for around 16 kilometers. So this was the first study done in London where the average cataract surgery produced a waste of 181 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And this study was done in 2011 with uh, nearly 2000 FACOs done in that center and the total waste produced was 405 tons in the total emissions. And these were the later studies done by Dr. Venkatesh sir and Cassandra that I was speaking about. And here what uh, Srinivas sir was mentioning, so it was almost in UK, if you had to do a cataract surgery, so equivalent to driving a car for 500 kilometers, whereas in Aravind or most of our hospitals, it would be equivalent to 25 to 30 kilometers because of our efficiency. So inspired by this, we wanted to evaluate our annual carbon footprint of cataracts in our institute. So in 2017, we performed around, uh, around 10,342 surgeries. So using online calculators and taking cues from previous studies, we did the calculation. So what we found out was each FACO produced a waste of 365 grams, producing nine kilograms of carbon dioxide, whereas each SICS produced 150 grams of waste, producing 3.2 kilos. So total our surgical emissions were equal to 55.3 tons. And the interesting point to note was FACO uh, surgery was 2.5, produced 2.5 times more waste when compared to SACS. And in the electricity emissions, again, FACO machine consumed uh, around 11 tons. And the general air conditioning, if it's a single room, it was 3.4. It was daycare, it was 5.5, but the numbers vary in single room, only 662 patients stayed, but they consumed 3.4 tons. Whereas uh, in a sharing room, which we did major of our surgeries, that is nearly 4,000, only 5.1 ton was emitted. And common electrical, appearance, uh, electrical appeal appliances were around 15.5 tons. And again, coming to the paid cases or FACO cases, the transport emissions by the patients were nearly 20 tons. Similar number of patients in campsites as they were transported in a single bus to and fro, it was only one fourth. Only 5.2 tons of carbon dioxide was emitted in SACS cases. So totally our emission as a hospital for doing cataract surgery, excluding procurement carbon dioxide emissions was 106.8 tons. And we attributed to point 
one six percentage of the total carbon footprint of our state Andhra Pradesh in 2017. A single eye hospital doing a single type of surgery. So then you can imagine the total number of uh, cataracts that are being done in India and the carbon footprint that we'll be producing cumulatively. So what are the changes we made? So first of all, we tried to go back to our good old uh, reusable gowns. So in that, we were able to reduce the waste by 5.4 tons and reduced by nearly 30 lakhs. Even if you include the dobi cost, the electrical cost, and even if you had to buy an industrial grade uh, uh, washing machine and everything, still you would be saving around 25 lakhs per year if you are doing 10,000 cases in an annum. And the next part was uh, the broly trap, the head trap, the eye towel, and the packings that were being used in the sterilization. Here again, we reduced our waste almost by 14 tons, and we could save around 7 lakhs with this intervention. And coming to FACO, here we have several kind of FACO machines where you have to dispose your cassettes or you can use a reusable cassette. So if it's a disposable cassette, the total amount of waste produced was 75 uh, kilos. And when you compare it with a, a machine that has recyclable cassettes, the waste is only 1.8 kilos. So that's a huge difference. And that's why if you are going to plan for multiple FACOs, especially in a high volume setup, you need to balance and have both kind where you need not depend entirely on disposable cassettes. And coming to the blade handles, this was the most useless thing we were doing because this handle, the plastic handles we were using were like some cheap uh, uh, pens or ballpoint pens we were using. But we went back to our old, uh, this metal uh, objects where you can just, metal handles where you can just dispose of the and reattach the tips. So this was having a good heavy feel and it had a very classical feel to it. And with this also, we could reduce the uh, uh, wastage by seven tons and we could save around four lakhs by introducing this old uh, things that we were already doing. And I know that uh, sterility is very, very important. So we compared our sterility rates after we did this intervention. In 2017, our end off rate was 0.07. And in 2018, it was 0.03. However, there is a confounding factor here. After the Arvind study, we gave uniformly intracameral moxie in all our cases in 2018. So that could be one confounding factor where the end of rate could be low. But still, we were doing good when we were using reusables. So I think as a, a team, we need to communicate with the industry about compact packing, unnecessary papers, and also ask them to promote reusable and sustainable consumables. So the, my take home message is we need to adopt a balanced approach without compromising on the sterility principles. And finally, uh, one tree can absorb 21 kilos of carbon dioxide per year. That's approximately equal to one cataract surgery. <coughs> Counseling, if we can counsel our patients to plant one tree after cataract surgery, it will make them carbon neutral. Thank you for the opportunity, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Madhu. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Now, let's quickly move on to Dr. Harshul Tak, what he has to say. Is Madhu more uh, curious on riding cars and uh, this fancy things, or you have anything else to say, Dr. Harshul? Yeah. Can I share my screen? Uh, oh, sure, please. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the uh, entire committee of IMSICS, Dr. Amulya sir. Uh, just a minute. Uh, Dr. Boramani and uh, Dr. Srinivas for giving me this wonderful opportunity. So uh, in today's era, we all know that uh, sterility is, the, is of paramount importance. So disposable is the way to go especially today in the COVID era, where there are high chances of transmitting the infection from one patient to other. So as, Doug, as Florence Nightingale, who is the uh, founder of the modern nursing said, says that no stronger condemnation of any hospital could be pronounced from the single fact that infectious disease have originated in it or that such a disease has attacked other patients than those brought in with them. We need to be very careful uh, about the sterility and the infection control. To, uh, just to uh, 
counter what Dr. Madhu has said. Yes, of course, we need to be careful of our carbon footprints to save our Mother Earth. But there are many other ways first to decrease our carbon footprint rather than to compromise on the sterility and the of our, of our patients whose eyes are precious. If you look at this data from the four major economies, uh, India uh, per capita only contributes 1.83 metric ton of CO2 emissions per year. And if you compare to US, it contributes 16 metric ton per year. So we contribute very little. And there are very many ways to decrease our carbon footprint. The biggest way is to not uh, to decrease our air travel, to decrease our motor uh, transport, to go with a bicycle, to ride a bicycle, go with the carpool, to conserve, to use solar energy, to decrease the electric consumption in our household, in our workplace. So there are many ways which, by which we can decrease the carbon footprint, which can make a difference. So now, what are the advantages of disposables which we get? We always get the safety and reliability. If we use them, we get the best quality in each and every patient. Sterility is ensured, the ease of use. And in India, especially, I can say that we always, we have now competitive cost if I compare with the reuse, reusable instruments. And of course, there is no repair or maintenance cost of these disposable uh, equipments. And ethically and legally also, they are safe. Let me tell you that what is the stand of the regulatory agencies in India about reusing the single use devices. In India, there is no regulation for reuse. Drug and Cosmetic Act states that devices must be used according to their labels. So if the label says single use device or single use disposable, we can't reuse it. US FDA also uh, now has developed a three class licensing system for reprocessing. So if we are reusing them, or if we are reprocessing them, then we need to take prior approval. And then it comes in the, all the ophthalmic devices, they come in the class three critical device. And when uh, US FDA says that the third party reprocessor and the hospital, whosoever is doing the reprocessing, they are responsible for the consequences. So let's see. What are the disposable devices we use in ophthalmology and which are not very costly, which can easily be used as a disposable devices, are viscoelastic solutions, surgical gloves, knives, knives should never be reused, balanced salt solutions, ophthalmic drapes, fluid management devices, disposable instruments like cannulas, especially should never be reused, sutures, ocular dyes, trip and blue, or other dyes, iris soaks, BHEX ring, CTR, Sioni ring, microchiton blades, lessic irrigation cannula, marker pens, and VR-surgery micro-incision instruments, which are especially 25 and 27 gauge instruments. So what are the risk of reusing and reprocessing? Reprocessing is equivalent to manufacturing the device. And it's, it's a regulated activity. If third party, as I said, reprocess it or hospital reprocess it, then they have to take licenses. It's not there in India, but there can be legal implications if any untoward consequences happen. Then there are technical issues that, that we need to know the design specification, we need to know the validation variation on functionality, and we can't trace the reprocess device. And there are of course operational issues that uh, quality can't be good. There are of course risks for patients. So what are major concerns with reuse and reprocessing? Of course, there are chances of endophthalmitis. And more than endophthalmitis is the TAS, that is toxic anterior segment syndrome. And we all know that ASCRS TAS for suggested the, what are the major causes of uh, uh, TAS is the inadequate cleaning of surgical instruments. There can be contamination of surgical instruments or IULs. It's, it may be because of the preservatives in the drugs, which we use intracamerally. It may be because of inadequate flushing of cannulas, use of enzymatic detergents, and use of ultrasound bath is also a very common factor. So these are the major recommendations to decrease the tasks. 
which we all should be careful of and we should never reprocess or reuse our surgical gloves also as many people use it so my take home message is use disposable as much as possible and use minimum recycled devices taking care of all the recommendation by task task force of ascrs and never try to reprocess ovds bss knives cannulas intracranial drugs surgical drapes surgical gloves dyes or iols and in the end of course you can decrease your carbon footprint by pedaling pedaling your cycle on by using solar energy i think that's a much better way than to risk the sterility of the patient's eye thank you very much uh, thank you dr harshal uh, you have countered it very nicely uh, and also i think dr madhu uh, what do you say because he is, he is now quoting about the acrs guidelines and all those things uh, and we all know uh, the in india it's the disposable uh, is not that much used and the more re reusable and recyclable is used so one minute rebuttal time for you uh, dr madhu sir yes sir in india actually i think for us we have a regulatory thing especially if you are an nabh accredited eco they have certain guidelines where you can safely reuse certain things and we are an nabh hospital so there are things that we reuse safely without compromising on sterility sir even multi vial multi packs you can use from the same vial like bss and all it's not practically to keep a new thing for every case that is what i feel so dr harshul see the drug and cosmetic act clearly says that we can't reprocess anything it has to be used according to the label what it says if it says it's a single use it has to be single use see in house processing we can do but still there are no third party processors reprocessor or like in america you know in america there are third party reprocessor then the owners uh, lie on the third party reprocessor or on the hospital they have to uh, take us fda approval and they become manufacturer now so uh, they have to take all the prior approvals for all these things uh, thank you dr harshal i now invite our eminent panelist and uh, uh, president elect dr barun naik sir uh, dr parikshit sir you want to just quickly introduce dr barun naik sir please yeah um uh, barun naik sir uh, as we all know is a wonderful human being and uh, he is the president elect of the prestigious all india ophthalmic society and now uh, barun sir what do you think is the verdict whether we have to go in for the reusable and recyclable or you want to go in for the disposables that is the only way to go i think both the speakers dr madhu and harshul has put up their points very very efficiently and it was really eye opener when dr madhu was talking about because i personally i am little biased towards reusing it maybe the cost factor maybe the other factor which i am considering but it's not that i am neglecting whatever dr harshul said but basically we are forgetting that all these we are falling prey to tricks of the company but if you see the same company earlier they used to produce something with less consumables now they just suddenly come up say sir now we cannot provide this and you have to use this disposables for each and every case so basically they are also trying to earn more and more and sell more and make more profit that is so we are falling prey to this and in this connection i just want to tell you one thing because i am really i have also advocated to the government of india with the help of a society over here in mumbai the legal medical legal society is a society so with that we had one seminar and after that whatever the the outcome was so a lot of issues were discussed one of the issues was reusable and i was involved in reusable things so in this i just want to tell you because the company was harshul said that they you can't reuse because the law doesn't allow it yes i agreed and the in the court of law you will always be caught because company are very clever they will put one round circle put two mark two right two inside and a cross mark what that indication is that you cannot use it for the second time so in case by 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 any bad luck if you have to go to maybe sir, your case goes to court with infection they will not tell you they will not try to find out where was the fault they will just simply doctor did you see this yes then did you see this mark do you know what does mean yes then why did you use this and then immediately the lawyer and everyone will pounce on you 
so for this because i had two different things because just uh, i'll take one more minute that one knife which i used to use bd knife which comes with a hood so that it protects the tip for anything suppose just i am giving one example for knife because knife what are the two criteria which i am concerned one is quality sharpness second is sterility so if my hospital the hood is basically provided so that it doesn't get spoiled now where's the my hospital can sterilize a diamond knife then why my cssd department of our hospital cannot be competent enough to sterilize this knife which is just simply company has put forward that it is uh, to be single use disposable so that is something we are unnecessarily falling prey and definitely dr madhu has put up his point very strongly and one of my colleague who is a gastroenterology surgeon he is very sarcastic in the same discussion what his comment was which is worth mentioning because he drives bmw so he said suppose tomorrow company puts uh, this circle and two and cross it do you think i am going to throw this um, bmw car tomorrow i am not going to use it so it's all the factor uh, the all the cost and the price and everything matter so ultimately i think we have to be rational and accordingly we have to advocate to the authorities and the government for making this whatever harshul said that in us there is third party which does that so that kind of thing i once i had advocated but it it was unsuccessful so i want that they should come with bigger bigger thank you very much yeah nice yes. sir rightly said that uh, recently maharashtra government is also in talks with fda to uh, start reusing and reprocessing the devices to decrease down the cost for pradhan mantri yojana also and that's true if if they allow we are ready to do it no yes yes so yes. steve can I, you uh, add, can add something to this uh, i am asking it. steve Uh, I think Dr. Chang is uh, commenting. Go yeah. ahead. Sir. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a survey that was done, AFCRS and AAO, and it is going to it's uh, coming out as a special report in the next month in JCRS, and we have 1,300 mostly North Americans responding, and overwhelmingly 80% of surgeons would prefer. reusable instruments and supplies 8% prefer disposable and uh this is really not a matter of safety and what the survey shows is that everyone believes this is about manufacturers making profit protecting their liability and the regulations just as you have in India being too strict and giving no discretion to the surgeon because we prescribe medicine off label all the time we use our judgment our scientific judgment so this is all theoretical questions of safety and i think the ervin data is overwhelming when you show that uh, even though they're reusing all of these things their rate of infection is 2 per 10000 and the united states the iris registry shows that our rate is 4 per 10000 even though we're wasting so much and so i think the biggest culprit for or waste and carbon footprint is the united states you know we're the leader in or regulation so please check out the survey next month thank you uh, thank wonderful you. dr sahu wants to make a quick comment dr chinmay nay nay why want steep to uh, contribute because he is involved in this uh, you know uh, end up thalmitis cases so yes. any any point from you steep my comment would be simply that what we do is we use some of each we have to look at every device we get and irrespective of how it's labeled we have a little bit more discretion than the americans do uh we choose how we use them so when you look at different things that we use uh, ovds have the highest risk of bio burden many years ago when we sat on the ovd panels different countries who sterilize their devices differently push to have ovds accepted as being sterile with a bio burden of 1 in 1000 which means that 1 in 1000 syringes you get is not sterile um whereas everything else we get that is labeled as sterile is 1 in a million and baked beans which are sold in poor african countries must be 1 in a billion because they're terribly afraid of the epidemics of diarrhea in poor countries so the sterility rates go baked beans are best surgical knives are next and ovds are worst now it depends where the obd is made 
the, the Swedish uh, National Society decided that they didn't want to accept a high viral burden of OBDs. And so the OBDs made in Sweden, one group, uh, the Helon group uh, made on the East Coast and the uh, other group made on the West Coast have bio burdens of one in a million because they terminally sterilize them and they're labeled as such. But the rest of them in the world, you never know. You, you hope that they're one in a million, but they may not be because they're not labeled as such. So I would never ever share an OVD for two eyes because you have a really high risk of it not being uh, sterile. Also the process of taking off the cannula when it's very viscous is dangerous with contamination. So, but then there are other things we have. So will we ever reuse a knife or something else? Well, we, we will re-sterilize it if we want to. And we have some knives that come disposable and some that are reusable tips or whatever. We use diamond knives and they're re-sterilized, but we're very, very careful. And we have, you know, in North America, relatively expensive sterilizing machinery to make sure that what we do is, is good. So I think we're in the middle. And I agree with David that a lot of it is to make money because companies realize that their profit margins have really been shrinking when they cater to FACO. And by making us buy everything new, they can sell more things and they can wrap it and sell custom packs and all that stuff. And that's an endless battle. So I, we all sit on the fence. We'd like to reuse some things, but we're stuck when we have to use them individually. Just be careful. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steve, uh, for the wonderful comments and uh, the caution as well. So quickly, uh, Dr. Chinmay, uh, you want to say anything before we move uh, on to the next talk by Dr. Steve? Srinivas, the point that I was going to make would be repetitive. It was primarily to reiterate what Dr. Chang said, that uh, the Arvind study with 237,000 patients clearly showed that they had lower you know, endophthalmitis rates compared to the IRI registry. So where safety is concerned, I do not think it's an issue. Primarily, you know, where the talk is on the carbon footprint that is getting generated, uh, we do have a responsibility to the future generations, and it's the right time to introspect and look into the possibilities. Uh, lovely talk by the debaters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chinmay, for that uh, crisp comment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so thank let's you. move on to the, uh, the next uh, talk and the debate, which are very hot and uh, very controversial. That is FACO versus SICS. So before we start the debate, uh, I, I request our uh, eminent uh, guest speaker from uh, Canada, Toronto, Dr. Steve Ashinov, to speak on the role of MSICS and FACO in the COVID and the post-COVID era. I would request Dr. Sahusa to please introduce Steve to all our viewers. Steve Ashinov, as you see, he's a handsome young man, you know, uh, he's the, uh, he's the Associate Professor of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences Global University at uh, Toronto. He's a graduate from Baylor uh, College of uh, Medicine and Austin, Texas, and postgraduate from Toronto. But his uh, interest areas are varied, and he's, uh, he's got interest in viscosurgical devices, echo emulsifiers, and massive designing and sequential bilateral cataract surgery, which he has founded and is the founder president. So it is, and he also interested in the uh, prevention of uh, end of thalmitis research. So he's, uh, his interest is varied, and uh, we are fortunate to have him with us. Thank you, Steve. Welcome. Uh, you can start your screen share, Dr. Steve. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, let me get this going. Okay, so um, as it turns out, the topic that was mentioned just now for me to speak on isn't quite what I was asked to speak about. So I'll talk about what I was first asked to speak about. But before that, I wanna thank you for inviting me to take part in this really excellent uh, symposium. It's always interesting to see the ideas that come from India and what's happening because it's a very different viewpoint than from Canada or the United States. So what I'm gonna talk about is where we stand now and the, the case for doing bilateral surgery and has COVID-19 act, act as an accelerator or is it a natural evolution of practice? And whether you do phaco surgery, femto surgery, or manual small incision cataract surgery, I think it's the way we're going to be going. And I'm gonna show you why and some trends that have been happening in the world. Um, these are my disclosures, none of which apply to this talk. 
So the question is why perform immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery? And the answer is very simple. It's better for the patient. It's really better for everybody concerned. Especially, I think, if you live in India, a lot of the patients come from remote areas. It's hard for them to get to you. And to have them come twice with the families, it's a whole big ordeal. And I'm sure a lot of them never come back for the second eye. So if you can do both eyes at the same time and have them walk away cured, they're, they're far better off. The same thing happens in Canada where we have patients coming from northern parts of Canada. So the first major publication on bilateral surgery was done by me with my colleagues, uh, Yaning Strub and Ranit Yagev in 2003, and we had a very low complication rate and really excellent results. But it wasn't just me, or different parts of the world were doing the same thing, and the Finns were probably the first in the world uh, to adapt, uh, to adopt bilateral surgery routinely, and by 2002, it was a routine uh, in Finland for whoever wanted bilateral surgery to have it. Sweden was looking at it seriously, and uh, uh, Bjorn John Johansson was publishing an article in the BJO at the same time as mine on his experience in Sweden. And the Canary Islands and Spain were very active. And uniquely, they submitted a study to the government of Spain. And the government of Spain was the only country I know of in the world that endorsed bilateral cataract surgery in 2006 through an act of parliament when they reviewed the study and said that as far as they were concerned, it's equally safe and effective as unilateral surgery. So this is my experience. I've done about uh, 11,000 uh, bilateral surgeries and about 80% of my case are bilateral. It would be 90% except that in some cases, the hospitals restrict me to doing bilateral surgery at some times because they don't get paid. So they say do unilaterals for a few days and we do. Uh, I, in all of them, I give intracameral vigamox and I think it's critical to give intracameral antibiotics when you do bilateral surgery. Interestingly enough, I was involved in a, a symposium uh, uh, online with the University of Laval, where I've been to speak, it's in Quebec City. And the chairperson, uh, Dr. Marie-Ève Lagarre, uh, gave this talk a couple of days ago, showing how they've adopted bilateral surgery. And in 2016, 17, they were doing 6% bilateral surgery. And then the year after 22%, then 43%. And this year, up until the time that COVID started and they were stopped, 58% uh, were bilateral surgery when they're giving the patients the, the choice to do it. And so all of the 14 surgeons in Quebec City, which is a smaller place than Toronto, uh, are now doing bilateral surgery. And probably the rest of Quebec will adopt it also similar to Finland. Uh, all of the cases receive intracamel moxifloxacin, the same as I've described to use. And their infection rate actually fell to one in 14 and a half thousand from about one in 6,000 have been they were doing unilateral surgery. And they've had no cases of bilateral simultaneous post-op endophthalmitis. This really reflects the global experience in those who adapt bilateral chronic surgery. They tend to do better and not worse. But the first person to do it was not one of us recently. No, it was uh, Jacques Naviel, who in 1747, when he began to do extra capsular surgery, uh, did them as bilateral cataract surgery. And he always did the left eyes first because that was his routine. It turns out I do left eyes first as well, not because of Jacques Naviel, because I didn't learn about him until much later. Uh, but after that, almost all of his surgeries were done as extra capsular surgery and as bilateral cataract surgery. So our society uh, was formed in 2008. And here you see the, the founders, except for the guy taking the picture. There were nine of us and uh, most were from Spain. You see the group from the Canary Islands is here from Spain. We had two British, one Swede, one Canadian and one South African. And we've really been talking about it all over the world. And our goal really was as we saw others adopting bilateral surgery to try to make sure they were doing it safely because different of us had different problems getting going and we wanted to make sure everyone was doing things with sterility, using intracameral antibiotics and things like that. The society has one rule and that is that if you have an unresolved complication with the first eye, for example, if you go and you get a small tear in the capsorexis but you finish the operation and it's fine and the lens in the bag, it's okay. But if you actually break the capsule and you lose vitreous and you're not sure if the lens is stable, then you should defer the second eye. And that's interesting because every single one of us who do bilateral surgery have found out that by far the best time to do the second eye is just after you finish the first eye. Because anything peculiar with that patient will be fresh in your mind. And invariably, the second eye goes easier than the first eye and has a lower risk of complications. So we have this dilemma. A year after we started our society, we published this document and we, we tried to call it general principles rather than guidelines because we felt it was kind of aggressive saying they're guidelines when they were just at that type point 15 of us in the society. 
But everyone who was doing bilateral surgery in the world piped in and put in comments and we put together this document, which has become accepted really as a standard document for the world on how to do bilateral surgery safely. So if you want to do it, I suggest that you read this, whether you do M6 or FACO or FEMTO, the principles are the same. As time went on, I got put in jail in Brazil for recommending bilateral cataract surgery. I discovered it was illegal then at, at the time. And then I got criticized in many countries. Uh, in Boston, I was uh, met by some lawyers uh, when I talked about bilateral surgery in 2003. But anyway, eventually it got to the point where we had open debates and I was surprised at two of these the first one at ASCRS in 2014, when I had been to Colorado and talked to them about bilateral surgery, and I did not was not aware they had adopted it. And so when Ken Cyberson got up to take the opposite side, he really took my side. And he said in the last few years, they had totally changed to bilateral cataract surgery, and 80% of their patients were elected to have bilateral cataract surgery. And the next debate was at ESCRS the same year in 2014, and Jose Guell looked for criticism in articles where there could be a higher complication rates in bilateral cataract surgery, and he couldn't find any. And he said that all the reports that he could find were supportive of bilateral surgery. And the only thing that he was concerned about is he felt that if we brought people in, did both their eyes, sent their home with no glasses or no, just eye drops, they would consider that bilateral surgery or cataract surgery was trivial and not take the care we wanted to take. So that I thought was not a severe concern. Other groups as well were entering into it, and this group helped me see from New York, we're going to be doing M6 in Africa and Asia, and they asked me to travel to New York and, and give them advice on how to do it safely and make sure that things were going well. And they had a whole organization putting together methods of doing it quite cheaply and, and making their own surgical instruments and trays, and they were very organized. And I really haven't spoken to them in the last year or two, but I understand they're doing well in different places. And then an American, Sloan Rush, who interestingly enough happened to be the son of one of my uh, good friends from medical school, Avery Rush, we were in the same medical school class. We both went to ophthalmology and he published the first paper in the United States talking about how you could adopt American system uh, finances to make it work in West Texas, where they are. And so the three of them, Avery and his two sons, Ryan and Sloan, were both involved in this study. So then now let me tell you some pearls. If you're gonna do bilateral surgery, the things that you find out, well, first is that when a patient comes to you with a cataract, and probably always in India, and very often in Canada and probably the US, the patient is not complaining about their bad eye. Because most people that aren't, let's say, doctors or lawyers that are sort of the regular people we take care of, come out to us and complain when their vision gets worse, not when one eye gets worse. And so it's almost always the better eye they're complaining about. And I didn't figure that out until I did a bunch of unilateral surgery on patients that had, let's say, a mature cataract in one eye and a moderate cataract in the other eye, and I would do the mature cataract eye, and they would come back and they would say, well, you know, doc, I now see better in the eye that you fixed, but the other eye seems worse to me, because of course they compare them. And I had to argue with them and explain to them that it was the other eye we were fixing. And so remember that it's the good eye that patients often complain to about, the fact that they lost their driver's license because their good eye fell below 20, 50 or so. And then there are many advantages that what the patients prefer bilateral surgery. There are fewer visits to come and see you, especially if they live far away. They don't lose binocularity or stereopsis. They return to normal life quickly. And my first uh, patients in large groups were doctors, lawyers, people who were busy and that wanted refractive lens exchanges for being either high hyperopes or high myopes. And we could do those in Canada as early as 1990, whereas the Americans weren't doing them then. So I got a lot of American patients as well. Um, and there are other things that when you change how they see, if you give multifocal lenses or if you change them from being a high amotrope to being amotropic, they adapt immediately when you do both eyes. If you do one eye and they're a high amotrope, they're going to see double until you fix the second eye. So they're not very happy. And, in, you know, there are complications that occur sometimes in surgery. And oftentimes if a patient had a complication in one eye, even if it was resolved, they're reluctant to come back for the second eye. And I have two patients that are functionally blind because they had a terrible problem elsewhere with one eye, got referred to me, and are just too afraid to go ahead and do surgery the second eye. So they walk around functionally blind and are too terrified to have surgery, despite my seeing them like 10 times and saying, I can do it with a femto, it'll be no stress for them, it's easy, and they don't want to do it. 
So then uh, Javit was the first to publish from the Swedish outcome study that we actually get more improvement in our vision when the second eye is done than when the first eye is done. And that's an important thing to realize because in some countries, like for example, Britain, they were reluctant to do second eyes in older patients because they felt that they already could see well out of one eye. But the truth is we see better when the second eye is done. And then our procedures are becoming quite quick and we get better care by surgical staff and everybody when someone doesn't stay in the operating room for 10 minutes, they're actually there for longer and the patient stays in the whole place twice as long and there's a lot more interest for them. And with COVID-19 pandemic regulations of having to wait between cases and sterilize the whole operating room and change the air, we can do many more cases in a day by doing bilateral surgery than unilateral surgery. And so that's a big advantage that came up with COVID, not expected. But the one I like the most is all these patients consented, but you get people that have problems in life and severe problems and we can fix them. So I never or rarely did people that had severely amblyopic eyes before I was doing bilateral surgery. But then when I started doing them and they had a dense cataract in an amblyopic eye, a lot of the patients said, well, why don't you fix it? I don't like the fact that it looks white. So I began to fix them. And I found out lo and behold, when you correct them optically and then their eye is straightened because I have a colleague who straightens them if they're not straight, often they see 2040 and they improve over a number of years. And so I don't think amblyopic eyes are a lost cause. And when you fix them, when you do bilateral surgery, they do much better. And then you get patients that have psychiatric problems. I've done many patients that were actually dying with terminal cancer that couldn't read because they had bilateral cataracts. And if you do bilateral surgery, they're much happier. They can at least function and read for the last part of their life. One of the things I want to tell you to do is not just read these documents, but when you do things, make sure that you keep a good record of what's going in the right and the left eye. So I first made these things typewritten and would post it on the microscope so I'd see that the nurses got what I asked them to get and they told me and they'd, they'd call it out like in a military role what they were doing as they passed the lens. But now I actually prefer to handwrite them. And I write these things and I stick it on the microscope so when the nurse tells me the lens is this kind of lens, this power, and the axis that we're working on is this, I know that I wrote it down in my handwriting and no one's changed it. And that way I've made no mistakes in the last 10 or 15,000 eyes. So it really helps. Make sure everything is independent, right to left for the two eyes, as if, as if it's a different person uh, when you do these. Next, be careful, use intracameral antibiotics. At first we learned that they help, they reduce infections, and now we've learned that even if you only care about money, you actually save money. It's cost effective and cost saving if you inject intracameral antibiotics. And even in the what the rest of the world considers to be ridiculous costs in the United States, at $20 per eye, it costs us in Canada less than $2 per eye, and it probably costs in India about 20 cents per eye to give intracameral moxifloxacin. So it, it costs us very little and is greatly beneficial. Be aware that, that people will come and make complaints about bilateral surgery because they don't want to do it for whatever reason. And the risk of endophthalmitis, as I showed you from Quebec, and in this study we did of the people who do bilateral surgery with an infection rate of one in 17,000 and no bilateral infections, the infection rates are actually the lowest infection rates reported in the world. Um, and then also be aware about people saying they changed the second lens. That may have happened in the days of ultrasounds, but it really hasn't happened to me since we got our first IOL master and now with IOL masters and lens stars and, and we do topography, it just doesn't happen. So it, theoretically it's possible, but it, it doesn't happen uh, ever as far as I can tell. When you want to discuss it and you want to write papers, make sure you use a terminology the society is approved of only because that way everyone in the world uses the same terminology and you can follow it. Two of the interesting comments I got were given to us at various meetings. And the first one was by John Boulder in, in 2008 when he did some calculations, he lives in London, and he showed that the risk of getting bilateral endophthalmitis after bilateral cataract surgery is one third as high as the risk of dying in a traffic accident for the extra visits required to come and see you if you do two unilateral procedures. So everything in life has risks, but the risk of dying in a car accident is higher than the risk of dying or having bilateral blindness from bilateral surgery. And then Olivia Lee calculated that the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis was one two thousandth the risk of dying from general anesthesia. And none of us ever worry about dying from general anesthesia, so I think it's not a significant risk. The real issue in the world is money. And uh, in each country, people will do what pays the best. And now that COVID-19 has been occurring, 
everyone's rushing to consider bilateral surgery because it can make their ORs more efficient and they can make more money. That's the reality of life. So the question I have at the end is, what's going to happen in India with, in terms of M6? Well, if you look at the progression of cataract surgical techniques, I'm sure most, well, all the Indians at least know that the first cataract surgeon in the world was Sushutra, uh, who began to do uh, couching in, in 600 BC. Um, and that was the same procedure used for over 2,000 years. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus apparently was a cataract surgery. And then we had uh, be able to extra caps and intra caps, and so more and more rapidly. And now we're going to FACO and to FEMTO. And I think that what's happened to me is I was surprised that my patients uptook FEMTO so fast because now over half of them elect for FEMTO. And I think th the same thing will happen in India. I think M6 is excellent as you've improved it but you will gradually go to the newer techniques, even though it's more expensive. As India's economy gets better, that's what will happen. So the rationale behind doing bilateral surgery, whether M6 or, or, or FACO or FEMTO, is it's just better for the patient, it's better for the family, it's better for society, it's better for whoever's insuring them. So in summary, bilateral surgery is increasing around the world, spurred on by COVID, uh, follow the principles of excellence proposed by the society, and uh, the reasons opposing it have not been verifiable in the literature. And the big issue is money. COVID-19 is pushing it. The documents for the ISBCS are now being kept on the I Foundation of Canada websites. If you want to get access them, you get them through here. So if you type in ISBCS, it will take you to those documents. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steve. Uh, you have very elaborately told about the, both the techniques and uh, the which one to choose. Again, you have said it very aptly that it's best left to the surgeon. Now, um, I, uh, due to the shortage of time, I uh, will quickly move on to the, the debate too. Uh, so yeah. that's again the, the, the most uh, hot debatable topic, that is whether it is FACO versus SICS in the, has the COVID pandemic tilted the balance. So now we have uh, our uh, chairman, uh, academic and research committee, um, uh, wonderful human being, Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, who is a, an eminent uh, faculty who has presented in most of the national and international conferences, a medical director of Eye Foundation, one of the pioneer in the cataract and the refractive surgery, and uh, who is now debating with another stalwart, uh, who is uh, Dr. M.S. Ravindra, the, the director of Kartik Nitralaya, and who has been one of the pioneer in uh, SICS and has brought a lot of changes in the way we think about SICS in India. So here we go ahead, first uh, six minutes uh, to Dr. Chitra Ramurthy. Madam, please go ahead. You are muted, madam. We are not able to hear you. Madam, you are muted. Please. No, please unmute yourself. From my admin, anyone can do this? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, madam, you have been unmuted. Go ahead. One minute, one minute. Okay. Very sorry for this. Uh, my very, very special thanks to Dr. Srinivas and the entire, my respected uh, friends and seniors of MSI's group. And uh, it's unfortunate that I'm going to talk something which they do not very much uh, believe in. But then I'm so glad that I have Dr. Steve talking before me. And here I go. And let's all accept that it's going to be taken in the lightest sense because it's a debate. So in the COVID era, there have been trials and tribulations and again and again and again, and it has got stretched to the limit that today I am going to debate about FACO and its validity in the COVID era against SICS. And believe me, I don't know how I got myself into this predicament. The only time you would ever look back is to see how far ahead you are. And the hardest thing about life, about moving forward, is not looking backward. Believe me, these two sentences are a little contradictory. But then, this is what I'm trying to convey to you, that the challenges of the hour should not make you backtrack on your footsteps. 
It just tells us that we need to circumvent ways to deal with a challenge. First of all, I don't even perceive a challenge. And then it helps you to understand your eminent technology even better. The code corona or the COVID status does not call for a techno technological change. It talks about work safety and the mantra today is to be safe. I'm not going to go on to this jargon of OT protocols, which all of us have heard in any number of webinars, but let's get to the crux of it. We've all come out of a lockdown, varied lockdown, but we have the same concepts clear. We have accepted a safe return to a work schedule with the same technology, with our same skills, but with a difference. Whether you do FACO or whether you do SICS, the must keep a wash, you mask the patient, of course you mask yourself. And do you advise COVID tests? Yes, there's a controversy to that, but you protect yourself, you're reasonably attired. The whole confusion came up with this experimental study that are aerosols generated during phaco emulsification. Then the next salient question is, that means you need to try out your different gadgets. And if you are using a phaco sleeve, an incision of 2.2 millimeters and a phaco sleeve of 2.2 millimeters, it was found that there was no aerosol gender. You, I went further, Sheen. This was not just proved by me, but proved by other exponents that there was no visible droplets. So do I discontinue my debate and say that I've already told you there's no generation of aerosols and a perfect FACO is a safe surgery. But no, let's, let's take it a little further. We have all accepted that the standard surgical antisepsis is using povidone iodine in all our cases. But one, now we also know that it reduces any theoretical viral load on the conjunctiva. We've also had studies where it has shown that 0.223% of povidone iodine used in vitreo ensured a 99.99% reduction of the viral load. So then, let's look at this surgery again. A small side port has got created. I just, into the dye is injected, the viscoelastic is injected, and out, out comes only, there's no aqueous inside, it's just BSS and the viscoelastic which is there even before I have started doing my fecal emulsification. So then, the mean volume of intraocular fluid measured with OCT is just about 0 0.07. 99% of our population have an anterior chamber volume of less than 0.29 ml. If you use IA, it creates dilution of the anterior chamber fluid, which obeys the first order decay. That is, if you use 2 cc of BSS and it has circulated in, the aqueous con uh, concentration is reduced to less than 1%. And if you use your conventional aspiration flow rate of 20 to 40 cc per minute, it takes 3 to 6 seconds, mind you, friends, in 99.7% of the patient to ensure that your aqueous is out. So if you believe about these aerosols, why don't you do an IA for a minimum of six seconds before you start your active FACO? And why not use HPMC and why not keep reapplying it every minute during FACO emulsification? I'm going to show you a surgery of FACO done in the COVID era. Intracameral xylokin, dye, viscoelastic is injected, and out, as I said earlier, the aqueous is out. The imagined virus load in the uh, aqua anterior chamber is out. And look at me, my 2.2 millimeter incision, measured and done. And then I go on to my rexis, a stained capsule, everything is done, a gentle hydro. I'm working with BSS and viscoelastic, my dear friends here. And then I go in with my FACO and then liberal viscoelastic on the wound for your imagined aerosol. And then a hard cataract deserves a high energy. But I have the most stable parameters. I have the century machine on. I have absolutely stable eye. I keep injecting, uh, pouring viscoelastic over the wound because my friends believe that there could be an aerosol contamination. Look at my side port. There's no leak of wound. I've polished the capsule. I've injected the lens. I have done an absolute safe surgery. So what is a controlled safe surgery? You avoid spray or aerosol, done. You avoid cautery, my friends, because that could also cause aerosol, and there is no cautery being used in phaco emulsification. You stick 
to small structured wounds. And that's what FACO is about. You minimize entry and exit of instruments, and that's what FACO is about. Then what is this we are seeing? A conjunctival dissection, a quarry being used, a large incision being created. Why the hell do I go back? If I have a FACO, I can do a 2.2 millimeter incision, a 2.4 or a 2.8. But in the COVID era, I do a 2.2. But with SICS, of course, we have so many incisions. I have convex, straight, frown, chevron. But believe me, friends, we all know that these are large incisions. If you want to understand about astigmatism impact, whether you do your straight incision, your frown incision, or your V incision, the astigmatic impact is significant, easily over one, uh, one diopter of astigmatism. SICS in any number of studies says there's greater astigmatism. So if you have a long incision, what am I arguing about? Your healing is delayed. There could be post-op problems. There could be high femur. There could be iris prolapse. Definitely a longer visual rehabilitation. And yes, probably increased post-op follow-ups. We don't want that in the COVID era, do we? So delight is beyond satisfaction. With SICS, delight would possibly be a dream. But friends, if there is no FACO, no LRCS, no multifocal, where is delight? You know, we could do FACO, a small incision FACO, and easily do a trab on the side, a squint on the side, and the pterygium on the side. But if I've done an SICS, I have really buggered up the conjunctiva, and I don't know whether I want to sit temporarily, I want to sit nasally. How do I deal with all the mess of the conjunctiva which I've already created? When the going gets tough, friends, the tough gets going. Look at these surgeries, which I'm going to show you. With an SICS, is a large wound. This is a dense heart cataract, a high hypro, and a shallow anterior chamber. This is a small pupil. Look at me doing the FACO without an iris flutter. Look at this heart dense cataract, an intumescent heart cataract. Look at me, the ease with which I'm doing the surgery. Of course, I could do SICS. I would create a large incision. I would insect, insert erectus and get the nuclear fragment out. Or I would bisect it. Or I would fracture it. But I would not be able to do in a 2.2 millimeter incision. And I would need pottery. So the idea is to optimize your surgical outcomes. Be precise. Because lack of precision is a danger. And here in the COVID era, the margin for error is very small. We are in an era of refractive cataract surgery, friends, where you're talking of Varion, we're talking of toric ioles, we're talking of panoptics, we're talking of Barrett's formulae, and a lot, lot more. There is no published literature on premium iole implantation, friends. So what are we arguing? Adopt the best technology and get the best. Don't go back. Friends, we are in the red zone. We are in 2020. The way forward is fake oil emulsification, and moving forward is our only way to survive. Okay. Yes, we are moving forward in the past diversity. We exist with the other technologies. We need to have our friends around. But why do we desert fake oil emulsification when we know that that's the way ahead, a way, way ahead of all of us? Thank you, my friends. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, though you exceeded time by two minutes, uh, I think I need to give again a minute or two more to your opponent. It was a wonderful uh, talk. I think your talk itself uh, uh, speaks the testimony that you're a wonderful speaker. So let's go with another uh, wonderful speaker, uh, Dr. MSR, sir. So do you agree with all the points said by Chitra, madam, or you have your... Uh, own reservations. I'm sure that uh, you are one of the stalwarts in SICS, so you'd like to uh, prove your point as well. Go ahead, sir, please. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dr. Srinivas. Thanks to uh, uh, all of you for putting up this wonderful... Am I audible? Yes, sir. Very much. Fine. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking of quitting this and switching over to the FACO emulsification from tomorrow. Such an impressive talk, Dr. Chitra. Congratulations. I thought, let me review my videos and see how I can improve further to match your uh, surgeries. So that's my SICS, uh, a routine SICS, which gives excellent results. I can finish it in six to eight minutes time. What I've done is the incision is a little posterior. Everybody knows that a limbal or a scleral incision is better. I made a 2.8 millimeters. I've taken advantage of limbus there. Instead of, while doing the access, instead of going through the entire tunnel, I'll show you in another video. I've gone through the floor of the video and rock steady and the anterior chamber. It doesn't shallow at all. 
There is a no leak of HPMC, and this cannula that I'm using to extract the to guide the uh, nuclear pieces out of the eye is uh, continuously injecting so that endothelial safety is maximum. We've done a lot of studies on endothelial uh, integrity in this technique as well as in the phacoemulsification emulsification done by the stalwarts in our institution. Anytime, anytime, always, when we calculate the endothelial count a month later, this particular technique has given much better results. And the loss of endothelial cells, if you're careful, while doing all these things is zero. While I can't say the same thing for phacoemulsification. emulsification. This tunnel that I've created is not stretched at all. We all know that, uh, you know, this is a slitting of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the cartridge that I do routinely to minimize the damage to the lens. I coat the lens with viscoelastic and I don't need an injector because of, I just use an 18 gauge rod to push the lens into the anterior chamber and into the capsular bag. No, it's over, surgery is over. Remove every bit of viscoelastic. It's done under topical anesthesia. There's no need to bandage. This is my phaco machine. That's all I need. And control of fluidics is fantastic. No machine can compare the fluidics I get with this. Let us see another patient. A, uh, a patient with uh, nanophthalmos. She has been uh, wearing contact lens plus glasses for the last 26 years. And uh, now I decided to put a lens. The lens this eye needs is 60 adapters. I could get it made by a manufacturer, and that's a 60 adapter lens which goes inside the eye, and the patient has been absolutely wonderful with one lens. The, I planned for a 0.75 adapter error on the minus side so that she's comfortable on this, and she achieved 1.25. That's another case. The patient came with one weak history of the uh, angle closure glaucoma because of micro spherophakia. I could easily remove it. And then because there is no posterior capsule, and this is cleocornea wound, I have a iris claw lens, which gets fixed to the back of the iris. And the surgery is over in a couple of minutes time. As you can guess, this is fixed on the posterior side. And how do you do a phaco on this patient? It's just impossible. Pressures were around 60s when I opened the eye. It's no way it's coming down. And the moment the surgery is done, the patient was put on anti-glaucoma treatment because the angle closure attack was quite long. There's another case, angle closure glaucoma. The surgeon has done an aridectomy. The pressure is not coming down. There is an evident iridocyclitis. Look at this. That's the area where the capsule has been damaged by the intense YAG laser. How do you operate on this patient? The pressure is very high. It's an inflamed eye not settling down. I could easily do an SICS in this patient I could extend the tear in the anterior capsule all around to create a rexis and then remove this. And how do we do a phaco emulsification if I have an option? My colleagues refused to take this up and said, you go ahead and do this, sir. I could put a lens inside the capsular bag and that's it. Postoperatively, the patient received. I had put translonone into the anterior chamber to reduce inflammation. Look at this patient. The patient needed a 14 adapter cylindrical power, uh, a choric lens. I could get it manufactured by my friendly manufacturers of IOLs and then endothelial count. Any case where there is a compromise on the endothelium, in our institution, the patient is referred to me because I can keep the most of the endothelial cells intact when I'm doing the surgery. Very gentle shifting of the nucleus into the anterior chamber. This patient received 16, 14 diopter cylindrical power into the eye on the right axis, and the patient had wonderful vision postoperatively. This is a post PK, and uh, the patient has been wearing a sort of contact lens to neutralize the high cylindrical power. And uh, the patient is now very happy to see the world without those high uh, powered contact lenses. That's the power. 14 adapter hydrophobic lens, as you can see here, that's implanted and positioned. Endothelial cells will take a beating if you're doing phaco emulsification, and especially when such patients are there, you have to go to the shelter of SICS. Whenever there is a conjunctival incision, I seal it up with uh, the uh, glue, uh, and uh, uh, that ensures that the surface is even postoperatively, and there is no contamination of the subconjunctal area 
uh, by the post operative none of these patients are bandaged post operatively they all go with seeing eyes and that's a boon for those patients who have single eye any cataract look at this i've entered at the limbus not through the tunnel i made a tunnel i've injected viscoelastic but entry with the cystotomy is that that so the lens anterior chamber is maintained throughout the uh, the surgery and uh, there is no tendency for running off very hard nucleus i take the shelter of a cystotomy to bisect it and uh, uh, that's it the nucleus is bisected see that the entire nucleus is bisected with it and endothelial protection is absolutely essential it's a very risky and novice people should not try this uh, i in continuously inject viscoelastic to separate the nucleus from the endothelium that's it very quick surgery and put the lens in the capsular bag let us see couple of more uh, surgeries and uh, uh, i would ask dr chitra in the rebuttal whether she would still would like to argue in favor of it look at this capsule the zonules are almost not existing it's it's like a it's like a boiled potato cover it moves the entire lens is moving i could still go and do it because i've entered at the limb, at the limbus and the tunnel is closed you see here no visco is coming out of the eye you can comfortably go inside do a axis and then remove the cataract and then remove the cataract and then put the intraocular lens there's no need for a ring there's no need for anything no need for uh, uh capsular tension ring and uh, put a lens which weighs much much lesser than your cataract and uh, now you're not pull the zonules at any point of time see you can see the pull on the zonules it's very very lax i know the zonules are very very loose there's only technique without how do you do a fake over when zonules are being stretched so much very carefully put it inside the cap once it goes and sits there nothing will happen to the capsule or back those zonules are weak the weight of the lens itself is so lesser than that look at this posterior capsule or posterior subcapsule or cataract i routinely do hydro dissection because i do this is impossible in the fake when a closed eye the tunnel is open there's no risk for the uh, for the break of the capsule you can see the plaque getting separated from the posterior cortex it's a very low pressure technique and not bombarding the eye with uh, fluid all the fluid i need is only 50 ml to complete the surgery while a classical phaco needs about 400 to 500 ml it fluid rushes through the anterior chamber look at this the opening is there because of the low pressure the cataract is only very is very easy posterior capsule is intact because there is no bowing of the capsule posteriorly i put the lens in the capsule or bag low that's the end of it so with these uh, couple of surgeries i would like to uh, stress upon that i don't need a covid to support that si says is better si says has always been better when compared to any other technique that's my submission thank you uh, okay ravindra sir that was a, a wonderful videos which you showed uh, so <coughs> one minute uh, rebuttal time for uh, chitra madam madam there is always uh, the saying always goes and uh, the most of the studies have already shown that in the covid era so this debate was in the covid era there are a lot of aerosols being generated most of the studies are telling and still you are telling to go ahead and do fico in these kind of patients you want to risk our patients one minute for a rebuttal madam please unmute yourself madam unmute unmute srinivas you hear me now Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. If you had actually heard me, by now you would have given up all the thought about aerosol. It is just some kind of a new interest being created. I do uh, see. I've never argued that that different surgical techniques or technologies need to coexist. An English man and a French man to coexist in the same same town. but that does not mean in a covid era you move from fake to sics now what is the logic behind it all the gimmicks which he did i can do with fake and even better and it's only fake is the way forward which was even nicely expressed by sri vashnav the why do bilateral surgery do fake in covid era or do i do sics it's your individual skill and your individual confidence in a technology there is no discussion here that is all i have to say wonderful yes uh, msr sir 
whether you are an English or a, a Spanish. Okay. What is that, madam? There are two examples you said. <laughs> French. French, French. Or are you an Indian, sir? It was not Bangalore in the birthday, you know, absolutely <laughs> pure 100% Indian and okay. I'm from Bangalore. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not from anywhere else. And I would see the one strong submission is that why I'm sticking to SICS while we have every kind of a commission here is that I am so sure, sure that the eye is safer with SICS, things are under con my control. My pulse rate does not increase by one iota when I'm doing any kind of complicated surgeries. So, uh, you know, uh, that's one thing. And, and the reuse is nil. The instruments I need are very few, and uh, I, it depends upon my skill. And I switched over to phaco emulsification. Probably I was the first phaco emulsification surgeon in the South India, way back in 1991. Uh, then I realized that I'm losing my skills. I'm a surgeon, basically. I'm losing my surgical skills. I immediately switched over to SICS and I retain those skills even now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we now open it uh, briefly for uh, four minutes of panel discussion. I uh, request uh, Dr. Boromani, sir, to please introduce our eminent panelist, Dr. Rohan Savan from UK. Yeah, Dr. Rohan Sawant is a very renowned eye surgeon from UK. He has 12 years of experience in ophthalmology, having worked in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and Ethiopia. He specializes in entry segment surgeries, as well as lasers in retina and glaucoma, and he has a keen interest in medical retina and neuro-ophthalmology. He has been a faculty at multiple national and international conferences. With this brief introduction, uh, I request Dr. Rohan Sawan to deliver his talk. Uh, Dr. Oh, Rohan, uh, just my question to you is, do you believe in what Dr. Chitra Madam said? Well, it's, it's, it's intriguing and interesting uh, in, in both ways. Each of them is right in their own respect. What I feel, uh, I had a few things to ask uh, the panel. Uh, when I initially, um, uh, and at the outset, I'd like to thank Sahu sir for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity to be uh, a part of uh, such an eminent discussion. Uh, I had this question of AGP because this is something which is been highlighted a lot in the UK NHS practice and a lot of surgeons are uh, being held back especially because there's a, there's a group in Bristol who um, posted a video about uh, aerosol generation uh, but as Madam pointed out really correctly and I think aptly it's, uh, I think the primary thing is the incision size even more important I feel is the wound construction uh, that video, which uh, I, I'm sure everyone must have seen, I, I think it was a bit more uh, dramatic. I have never seen so much of aerosol generated in a cataract surgery, regardless of whether it was fake or, uh, or in small small incision, there's no question of an aerosol. Uh, but I think a well-constructed incision should not generate that much amount of aerosol. Uh, and of course, a smaller incision uh, with the 2.2 is even better. I think the debate is about uh, a couple of things which uh, I found interesting in uh, whilst both of them were speaking. Uh, the setting is very important. I think uh, the difference in between uh, what the patient expects from a surgeon and how accomplished the surgeon is with a particular procedure. Uh, and as Sir uh, MSR sir correctly pointed out, there are a few surgeries which a novice surgeon shouldn't even attempt. And he's very right in that. It all boils down to the experience of the surgeon and also the setting, and the, the, the debate of endothelium will, will always exist, regardless of whether it is COVID or not COVID. Um, the only thing which I feel from, uh, uh, from the surgeries and the difference is, uh, what about the difference in the astigmatism, which is generated by a slightly larger incision? In these times, in 2020, where we are looking at cataract surgery as a refractive surgery. And that is my only question generated uh, from the debate. But as I said, excellent speakers and excellent surgeons. So nothing more for me to say in that respect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rohan. Uh, I think Boramani sir wanted to make a quick comment. I just wanted to make two quick comments because I am very much specialized in astigmatism management with SICS. So if one learn advanced SICS, you can beautifully manage astigmatism. On the contrary, you can neutralize the larger and larger astigmatism. Even Dr. Ravindra's 6 mm incision doesn't induce much, much astigmatism, but this is an advanced SICS and one has to learn it. As far as, as, far as the aerosol is concerned, aerosol is uh, generated in both the techniques. 
it is not that SSA doesn't generate aerosol. So one has to be careful, and one has to be whatever you are conversant with. Only because of the COVID now, don't shift from PECO to SICS. Whatever your master technique, you continue the same technique, but with a more care. Only I wanted to make one point here that in India, especially, most of the eye surgeons are having smaller setups, and they don't have class B autoclave. So the sterility of the tubings is a much concern, especially it becomes more in the COVID area. Because unless you have proper class B autoclave, which will take care of all the lumens, echo may become a slightly risky procedure. This is my point. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, any panel wants to make one last quick comment, please? Uh, Dr. Steve? Unmute, please. Unmute yourself, uh, Dr. Steve. Yes. I don't have any great comments, but I stand by what I said before in my talk that what's going to happen in India, as has happened everywhere else in the world, is people will gradually go to more elaborate uh, methods of doing cataract surgery. And you will go from MSICS, although I think it's a great procedure. It's better than before. But as you get smaller and smaller incisions, you can do things more precisely. And you will go through the process everyone else has gone through from extra caps to small incisions, extra caps to FACO. And you'll probably will all go to Femto because as all these devices get cheaper, uh, you find that as economies get better in different parts of the world, that the money isn't such a big deal. And I was amazed to find that now over half my patients actually asked me to have Femto. Okay, great. I, thank, you. Them thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, I fully agree uh, in the sense that SICS can produce additional astigmatism, but as Dr. Jagnath Boramani has done extensive study on it, that can be controlled. Like you have a steep axis, you have flat axis, if you have 0.75 or 1.5, that can easily be controlled by your tunnel design instead of going on to the Toric lenses. So Boramani explains it beautifully, but but it's an advantage. The ability to create an astigmatism SIA in SICS is an advantage and is not a disadvantage. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Sir. you. So you have, I have one comment? Uh, you when have. You do, yeah. If you do bilateral phacos on patients or bilateral femtos with small incisions, I have my patients that go and play golf in the afternoon after I finish their wow. surgery. And, and that's not going to happen with, with M6. And no matter what you say, I, I, I'm, no, I'm sure what you're doing is way better than before, and it keeps getting better. But the other steps are still better. And you'll <clears> see <throat> as time goes by that that's what will happen. Because uh, we all believe that we could do uh, uh, this is this is a never-ending uh, topic, and uh, the controversy goes on and on and on. And uh, even if you give you uh, three months of uh, lockdown of the COVID, this doesn't end. This is uh, such a wonderful topic, and in fact, uh, four thousand claps I'm hearing. So I just mean to say that there are more than four thousand viewers who have already logged into this, who are uh, really watching all the stars speaking and the debaters going on. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chitra and uh, Chitra Madam and Dr. Ravindra sir. So we'll move on to the next talk and then we'll have a discussion again. That is by uh, Dr. David Chang. And uh, who doesn't know Dr. David Chang? Everybody knows him. But as a formal introduction, I would request Dr. Sahu sir to please formally invite Dr. David Chang. Sir, so you have to unmute yourself, Sahu sir. So, unmute your mic, sir. Unmute your mic. No, uh, uh, Mislin, can you unmute Dr. Sahu, please? Raman or Mislin, can you please unmute Dr. Sahu, sir, please? I think we can skip the introduction, actually. Okay. Fantastic. That itself shows uh, how humble you are, Dr. Chang, and we are we are eagerly waiting for your talk to listen okay. to your talk. All right. All righty. Great. So I was asked to uh, give my perspective on M6 as an American FACO surgeon, and it started uh, with my first trip to Aravind in 2003. And these three friends continue to uh, collaborate with me and teach me. Uh, a lot of things, and they're now leaders within uh, Irvin. And of course, that's where I was introduced to this high volume, uh, you know, 16, 14 case per hour way of doing things. And I was so convinced that in uh, 05, I wrote this editorial for the British Journal 
saying that this is really the key to tackling our greatest challenge, which is global cataract blindness. But back then, you know, M6 was not getting a lot of respect and a lot of phaco surgeons were really uh, criticizing that this shouldn't even exist. Uh, and why should we be teaching that? And so we were, I was involved in this uh, randomized controlled trial with Dr. Sandik Ruit uh, from Nepal that we did in 05. And what was unique is this was in a charity population, but they chose people that were close enough to Kathmandu that they could follow them for a year. And we did this camp. Uh, someone, if you could mute. Uh, I need someone to mute in the background, if everyone could mute, please. Uh, so we chose uh, this monastery about a, an hour's drive from Kathmandu to do our study. And all the patients had a uh, pre-op exam there. They had a retro bulbar. Uh, this is just showing the prep. Uh, and then they were randomized uh, so that they could have surgery during about a day and a half, either with me doing their FACO or Dr. Ruit doing the m stick, And here was his operating room, which is a converted classroom. And in my operating room, we managed to get the machine I was using at the time, the AMO Sovereign. I was using, using AMO lenses. And we even got a Zeiss microscope. It was to try to sort of give me the tools that I would normally use. You can see at the bottom, this was not like my American cataract population. There's a lot of people with advanced cataracts and mature cataracts. Uh, and I think that was the point of this study. Here's the study group uh, spending the night in a prayer hall uh, in this monastery. And what made this uh, valuable besides the randomization was the frequent follow-up. And all of these patients were followed for a year for things that included the refractive results. So what were the outcomes? Well, if you include turnover time, M6 was certainly faster. I was going as fast as I could, but uh, no match for M6. And for complications, I actually was just relieved. I thought I was gonna maybe show up with 20% capsule rupture rate. I did have one posterior capsule rupture. I got the nucleus out, but M6 had none. Uh, if you look at astigmatism after the initial period, because we both operated temporally, it was about the same. Uh, uncorrected acuity. Now, it's very important to point out, we're looking at 2060 vision, which is, you know, the WHO sort of functional uh, cutoff. This is not like our Americans that want 2020, 2025. But for 2060 acuity, there wasn't really a difference at six weeks or six months or even at a year. So this shows astigmatism control uh, is good with both. If you look at best corrected acuity, again, uh, there was no difference up to six months until about a year later, you started to see more drop in best acuity with uh, SICS, and that's because of using PMMA lenses and PCO starting to show up uh, at that time. But our conclusions were really that the M6 was faster at a far lower cost per case. And if you look in terms of this type of population with the 2060, the uncorrected acuity was really comparable. Um, so if you compare everything, it actually uh, turned out that safety was about the same. And this was published in the a AJO uh, and at the AAO uh, annual meeting. Uh, we did some other studies. This is with Dr. Venkatesh. We did one of uh, M6 versus FACO for white cataract. Uh, they were about the same. And Dr. Harapri and I looked at all the surgeries done at one year at Moderize, 80,000, and we looked at safety with the complications, reoperations, and looking at surgeon experience. So out of these 80,000 cases, you can see that the complication rates were really comparable at their institution for FACO and M6. But if you look at surgeon experience, now this is the staff, FACO was in light purple, it was about the same. But if you get less experience, these were the fellows, these were the residents, the complication rate with FACO goes way up and it was highest with these visiting trainees from places like Southeast Asia and Africa who go there for, to, to learn. 
And this really just showed us that even though the overall complication rate was the same, you, uh, surgeon experience made a big difference. So if you have less experienced surgeons, such as in developing countries, uh, this seemed to show that M6 was safer, uh, particularly with uh, what, not dropping the nucleus, where if you don't have vitreoretinal retinal surgeons available, it's a disaster uh, in developing countries. With respect to PMMA IOLs, you know, that was the issue with PCO. And so we worked very hard to figure out a way to put a square edge on the Oro Lab PMMA lens. And this is a study that was published that we did where we use the oral lab square edge PMMA on the top versus the rounded edge on the bottom. And these were Dr. Harapriya's patients. These were two eyes of the same patient. We had 50 patients where one eye got a square edge, one eye got a rounded edge, but it's the same patient done simultaneously. We did another 50 where she put an acris off in one eye and then the other eye of the same patient, a square edge PMMA. The other strength of this study was digital photographs on every patient going out for nine years. There's no other PCO study like that. Uh, and so this is the round edge in the bottom, and then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a square edge in the bottom, and the round edge on the top, two eyes of the same patient. And then here, this is the Acrosoft on the top with the, um, the square edge PMMA on the bottom. So let's look at the comparison, square edge PMMA in blue, and what you see is that the round edge PMA, the PCO rate goes up and up, and it doesn't stop at five years. When you go out to nine years, it's still rising, suggesting that it's just a matter of time for everyone to get PCO with a round edge PMMA lens. And we actually found that the PCO was lower with the square edge PMMA compared to the Acrosoft, and that was statistically significant. Remember, these are two eyes, same patient, uh, going out to nine years. Um, I learned M6 really doing a camp such as this. This is in Ethiopia. Uh, and my teacher is Jeff Tabins over here on your left. I'm over here. And this is the problem in the US is we don't have a way to learn this technique. Uh, we don't have the patient base. Uh, but when I was fortunate to do this, I now use this on my worst cases. It's better for the cornea and there's a lower risk of dropping uh, the nucleus. So here's one such black nucleus. I've enlarged the pupil, stained with dye. I do a can opener here, extend the pocket, express it, and then uh, I'm gonna put in a PMMA lens in this case, because I have a large incision. And you can see a single suture is uh, for my temporal incision is how I close that case. Uh, so I'll do this several times a year for the worst uh, cases. Now, this is two cases of mine where I converted from FACO to extra cap. On the bottom one, I have a, a radial tear that's come out toward the incision. So I'm going to stop. Look at the upper one. You see a lot of FACO denesis just as I initiate the CCC. And so in both of these cases, I abandon my temporal clear corneal incision and I move superiorly to convert to a manual extra cap. And I do this early, not because I'm in a lot of trouble, but I've just decided, you know, the risk ratio now is too high with FACO compared to the M6. And I do this to contrast on the bottom, I'm showing converting to a manual SICS, whereas in the top, I convert to a standard uh, ECCE, like most Americans uh, would do. Uh, they both work. I think the, the key is to convert. Uh, once you tear the capsule or you have a zonular dialysis, of course, uh, it's much harder to salvage uh, that case. Uh, but uh, the time is about the same, but obviously the, the closure is going to be a little bit easier. So it's just two ways uh, to show these are, again, in my own cases. And I think this is the problem in the U.S. is Surgeons only know how to do one thing, FACO. We don't get experience. Uh, residents now don't learn how to do even the extra cap on the left. Uh, and so what they do is they keep doing FACO and they keep progressing and progressing until finally the nucleus drops. Uh, but it's really a matter of not only uh, avoiding that, but the endothelial cell loss, as was, uh, as was mentioned, is very high in these complex cases uh, where you're almost doing anterior chamber FACO. Uh, so here, you know, I'm using uh, 
a lens loop on the bottom. Because I converted early, uh, you know, I might have been able to do FACO on both of these cases. I might have gotten away with it. But the point is, if your complication rate is 5%, that's still much higher than it would be with M6. I just used the same three-piece acrylic lens. I just didn't fold it here. And then you will see in the bottom that I put uh, just a single suture to close, whereas in the top, I had about nine sutures to close. And that's really the difference here uh, in terms of the SICS in the bottom, the manual extra cap in the top. But again, these are my own patients. And uh, it just shows that uh, I could have done FACO, but I think I'm better off uh, converting. So uh, what I've learned is that for the developing country, uh, there's no question that M6 is not only more cost effective, but I think it's scalable and safer, uh, particularly where you have surgeons without as much experience with FACO, you don't get into the serious problem of corneal decompensation and drop nucleus with M6. PCO, all of the oral lab PMMA IOLs, they supply so many of these uh, for developing countries worldwide. Uh, I'll now have the square edge thanks to our study. And in the US, I think this is a great option for the ultra dense lens, but it sure helps if you're proficient in any type of extra cap to not be forced to continue FACO uh, when you're not comfortable. We don't have time, but maybe in the future, I'll talk about using a my loop to do an extra cap. We're doing a study uh, with Aravin, but uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll save that for another year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Chang. Uh, that was really a wonderful talk. So we'll have a, a discussion for a minute. Uh, Dr. Hossam, you want to say, you wanted to say something? Uh, okay, Dr. Joshi, thank you very much for uh, your invitation. Uh, thank you, Dr. David Chen, for this great presentation. Uh, as usual, I agree with you about your uh, study you have shown at the, uh, the beginning of your uh, presentation, but it was at the past, but still up till nowadays, I have an experience uh, 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 during the last series of cases I have done with both FACO and the MCICS in the same patient in dense brown character, even character negra. The, 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 the eye done by FACO was well. I, Actually, I, I can do both because I'm FICO and MSI surgeon and trainer at, at, the, end, uh, at the same time. Uh, and I'm conducting the old training programs about that in my university, at other university, for all my residents and colleagues. But actually, I have found that the, 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 uh, the eyes have, done by, uh, have been done by the MCICS was with shorter time less uh, stress on, on, uh, on the surgeon, uh, and at the same time with quicker recovery about uh, the corneal uh, clarity, about uh, the spasm of the patient after that. Uh, so I'm encouraging to, to, to keep in our minds or to set in our minds again, to shift earlier before getting any complication. If we got a cases like that, to, to think, to shift from FACO to the MCICS, especially we have no problem now because they are still sutureless. If you place your tunnel uh, uh, or, or your uh, scare tunnel incision away from the limbus about 1.5 or 2 millimeter from the limbus, you have actually uh, very less or no astigmatism. I have recorded a cases with 0.75 diopter astigmatism. If I put my incision at its proper side and on the steepest K, uh, there is no problem with astigmatism. I can now use the MCICS with all types of ILs, even the premium ILs. So uh, no need nowadays to stress ourselves, actually to, to decrease the cost, the time, and, uh, and so you have the same result. Thank you, sir, for your uh, great presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Awesome. And uh, I think, Dr. Chang, yeah, you can uh, uh, have a few more comments after the next debate we are going to have. And uh, the next, uh, I think, we'll start uh, with a, a saying by John F. Kennedy, who says, that without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed and no republic can survive. 
So we have the next great set of debaters here on the topic, has SICS done this service to the rise of FACO in India, where we have an eminent faculty, Dr. Vyal Rajshekar, sir, graduated, post-graduated from Ames. He is the president of Karnataka Ophthalmic Society, the founder chairman of Shekhar Netralaya, and overall, a wonderful, excellent orator. So here we have uh, Dr. Vyal Rajshekar, please. Thank you, Dr. Joshi, and the thanks to the organizers for organizing such a wonderful webinar. It's a great privilege to be amidst of uh, best of the surgeons of the world. So I feel it's one of my privileges. Uh, my talk is on whether SICS has done disservice to the rise of FACO in India. I am thankful to, yes, it has. I am thankful to all my previous speakers who have made my job easier. Something like what Dr. Chang was saying in US, he, he could not get a chance to learn SICS for a long time because FICO was there. In India, the reverse is happening. So many SICS surgeons are there. Having said that, I, I have no financial interest in this. I respect SICS. I do both FACO and uh, SICS. Wish SICS had done better service to FACO. Feel that patients should get the benefit, full benefit of FACO. Because in India, for many cases, they're not getting the full benefit of FACO because there is a tilted bias towards one for whatever reasons. And we'll get into those reasons. And I'll make my opponent's job easier because she may not have any points to prove later. Will not repeat showing any videos in my talk, so I'll keep. So to say the disservice part of it, disservice is an unfair or a harmful action. Here, it's not doing any action like that, but it's been a little unfair. There's another definition also, unhelpful kind of a thing. So SICS would have been more helpful to FACO is uh, the opinion. And so instead of using that harmful, I'll go for the synonyms that an injustice that it has done to the patients at large. I'm not talking of surgeons or anything. Patients at large. A patient who could have got the best of the benefits of FACO for various biases, he has SICS done. So that's because we get tunneled into either this side or that side, which is the core of what I'm going to debate on. Is that because SICS is bad? No, it's not. It's not bad. It's a good surgery. It's not. So is it because SICS is too good and it is shadowing FACO? No. No, both have their own places. And so where is the disservice coming from? Here, uh, I, I, seats are shown in residency. When a student is getting introduced to ophthalmology, then he, he gets to do, gets to see, gets to hear more about SACS under that safe kind of a heading. And that's what he gets to see. That's again, you know, we saw in the previous speaker's uh, slides, the complication rate in FACO was so high during residency program, it, it puts a seed of fear in them. And the same seed that is shown in residency towards SACS is sprouting in fellowships because in fellowships, they get more trained under larger community kind of setup where for various reasons of time and uh, other reasons, more of SACS is done. And whatever they have learned, then they'll try to practice. And when they come to the practice, they have constraints. Constraints because they are not so well trained in FACO. Constraints because of some financial reasons. So and hence, they try to continue doing what they have learned, what they have seen. And once they are good at doing the SICS and can afford a FACO machine, can do FACO for the deserving patient, but that time, the mind block comes. When everything is going well with this, why should I change over? Is it not a disservice? There is certain good things in FECO, a lot of good things in FECO, a lot of beautiful things in FECO. Just because you are good at something, why should you not get the best at the other end also, is my topic. So ecosystem of disservice, if you go to that, this is because the same thing, when I'm doing well, why not continue that? And the fear of dropped nucleus, you talk of a fellow, why don't you do uh, SIC, this thing FECO? He's, Afraid of drop nucleus. In trained hands, drop nucleus is such a rare, rare thing. So that means it is not the complication. It may be a part of the learning curve. You just have to come. While learning cycle, you fall sometimes. It doesn't mean that you don't learn cycling at all. So that's that's the thing. So that's the push that has to be given. That is where a lot of disservice is being done. And 
uh, we are not allowing people to come out of such fears and get onto the best part of getting the best out of the FICO. And again, free surgery situations, cost effective comes, and then you don't go and do the FICO emulsification. So uh, when you come to the differential levels of training, there is already a bias towards SACS in India. I'm talking in India. And hence, these surgeons, very skilled fellows, they do excellent service. They do excellent surgeries, very skilled. But they go on to advocate one thing, saying, you know, SACS is better. My results with SACS are good. Why should I do FACO? But should they not taste FACO? And when a patient comes, should they not give both at the same platform and choose what is best for the patient during that situation? This is where a lot of disservice is being done. Since they start doing what they like or what they have been trying, they go on rationalizing that and then they will go on to the denial. Denial saying, you know, SACC is good, it's, uh, that's not required, and these are the things. So, this service is in the blind spot of overall SACS environment. So, it's not giving the patient full benefits of what other technique can give. And this blind spot is also making people grouped as SACS surgeons and FACO surgeons. So why? You are a cataract surgeon. You are an ophthalmologist. So this has its place. That has its place. Why don't you do that? Just because you do SACS, why do you push the other thing away? This is where a lot of this service is being done. And all the SACS surgeons should wake up. And also, FACO surgeons should learn SACS. Should learn SACS. And uh, many times, it's, it, it's a demanding surgery. It requires more skills. And in tough situations, it definitely helps. It has its place. I'm not when I'm saying I'm debating. I'm talking about the disservice of SACS towards FACO. I'm not talking that FACO is can cover everything and it can replace that. I'm not talking that. But the disservice it's being is the point that we have to note. And hence, my point is the early clearance of these blind spots, and then place FACO and SAC in both same platforms. When a patient comes, don't keep a charge differential of so much. When you keep a charge differential, you get biased to push either one or the other. Then when you are pushing, you talk of the ill effects of the other. No. Both are good. Both will give results. But in your case, because it's of so many other reasons, FECO is a better choice I am doing. For you, this is a better choice I am doing SACS. Keep them at the both platform and give the best of both worlds to the patient. Don't shadow FECO just because you do SACS. Don't shadow FECO and talk ill about that. And don't do disservice of not. So, uh, this is, with these words, I want to thank the organizers. And I'm sure uh, I have made job for my opponent easy. She may not have much point to talk, but I would like to listen to her. Over to you, Srinivas. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a nice talk, and uh, I think uh, no comments are to be taken seriously in any in these debates, as all are knowing. And uh, it's an ISM SICS uh, group uh, uh, conference, and uh, definitely we are hearing a lot about against SICS. But the only thing is here is the learning points to be taken from both. I respect the speakers; they have done their job very nicely. I think we move on to the next, uh, 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 Madam uh, Dr. Ruchi Goel. You have to do justice to SICS now. Now, uh, all, all the shoulders, are, uh, all the responsibilities is on your shoulders now. So, just quickly to the, Dr. Ruchi Goel is a professor at uh, Maulana Azad Medical College, uh, Delhi, and uh, she has uh, even authored a book on MSICS. Uh, which uh, probably she would like to gift it to Dr. Vail Rajshekar sir as well. And then she has uh, more than 100 uh, publications and uh, she is also the SICS trainer at uh, Orbis International. So with this, uh, we would like to hear from Dr. Ruchi, madam, please go ahead. Six minutes starts. Okay, so um, I think my... No, just, just press slideshow, madam, slideshow. Yes. yes. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks a lot for making me join this uh, webinar. It's been a very interesting uh, journey through 7 p.m. Uh, today. And uh, Dr. Rajshekar put in a lot of points, and, you know, you'll have a lot to hear from me. 
in the subsequent uh, slides. Now, I think first I will start with the, the picture of our own Dr. Amar Agarwal. And, uh, you know, he claims that Chennai is the hub of uh, phaco emulsification. And they have more than 150 patients coming in daily for medical tourism. He, I think we all know him. He is famous for his uh, micro-knit all over the world. Now, uh, Dr. Rajshekar, whom do we want to serve? The machine, the machine maker, or the human beings? I think I'm at loss to understand uh, what you really wanted to serve. Are you treating your patients, or you, are, uh, you want to please the machine makers, or earn money? What is your ultimate aim? Uh, you, can be a, you don't want to be just an SIC surgeon or a FACO surgeon, but you should be a comprehensive cataract surgeon so that you can scientifically decide which patient needs to be operated by SICS and which patient requires a FACO surgery. I am a postgraduate teacher and we run a residency training program for cataract surgery at our center. And you know, our journey uh, starts uh, from uh, uh, imparting first the theoretical knowledge, then we go to develop the hand-eye coordination, and then we shift on to ECC, SICS and FACO emulsification, and by the time the the resident is through his uh, you know second year of post graduation, they are perfect in all these surgeries. So the problem probably, Dr. Raj Shekhar, is that you do not find a teacher like me. So this is the book which uh, Dr. Joshi had just mentioned, and you should have you know you should share with your students good learning theoretical aspects before you. Uh, embark them on any kind of practical training. So uh, this is one of the books. It had each and every steps of SICS surgery that would be very easy and useful for learning. As Dr. Raj Shekhar also mentioned that SICS is technically more difficult than phaco emulsification. Now we also monitor the progress of the surgical skills that our residents uh, pick up and we use different kinds of scoring systems until the student uh, learns one part, he is not allowed to shift on to the next step of the surgery. These are the different wet labs that I have organized. And just look at this. Simultaneously, we are teaching both SICS and PECO emulsification. So to, to reiterate, it's not just one surgery that one needs to learn. You have to learn everything and see how they emerge after the training program is over. They are so happy. Just look at that. There is a FACO machine line there, there are SICS, so they are learning everything. Now let us look at the two surgeries together. Lots of steps are being mastered when you learn SICS. The triplanar wound construction, the capsular rexus. In fact, if you are able to do a larger capsular rexus in SICS, doing a slightly smaller capsular rexus in FACO emulsifications becomes far more easier. Your hand-eye coordination improves your nucleus manipulation improves, and in case you have a rent or you have an issue with the FACO machine, just now when Dr. Raj Shekhar was speaking, in between his voice was becoming, you know, it was dragging and things were happening. So what happens if your FACO machine doesn't work? I've had experiences when I had gone to Orvis as a SIS surgeon, surgeon and the FACO surgeon from some, you know, a very high reputed center was having problems because he was stuck and he only knew how to do FACO emulsification. Whereas us in here, we learn each and every surgery completely and we are masters of both. So you can learn all the steps by the time you go to FACO emulsification. So if you learn SICS before you learn FACO emulsification, your learning curve is going to be smooth and you will have less unforgiving complications. Dr. Raj Shekhar also mentioned that all of his fellows are afraid of having a nucleus drop. So if you have a smoother learning curve, you are less likely to cause nucleus drop because you've already mastered those uh, steps and you will be more confident in case you want to convert immediately and in between you don't have a, a standby help with you and you have promised your uh, patient that you're going to give a sutureless surgery. So to conclude, SICS is a faithful friend. Why? Because it is a boat that keeps the briny waters from entering your lungs when the life becomes so strong. And Dr. Raj Shekhar, I would just request, please 
hire teachers like us who can teach you both the skills simultaneously effectively thank you so much thank you thank, thank you, you for everyone. a wonderful uh, rebuttal yeah so i think uh, dr wailar sir i'm sure that he yeah. is also a wonderful uh, <laughs> Uh, wish i could hire you ma'am after you write a book saying you know peko is one of the best surgeries also because till now we have been writing only on sics so i once you write the other book also then probably i'll hire you as a teacher now you know see you you spoke of mission see when i talk of peko i am not talking of a mission it's one technology when you talk of sics you can't do it without microscope just because you want to don't want to buy microscope you you don't do with a loop see it is another technology so when i am promoting feco i am not promoting this is a blind spot when you when you the, the, that's where we go wrong actually and then you showed surgery of mature cataract if you had shown a surgery of uh, uh, psc just psc with 612 vision going for a multifocal lens with feco and with sics i would have appreciated then you know that's a balanced view of putting things so then you know that is the benefit we are not giving to people so when you are training students you are training on one and fear is not because of me because of teachers like you who write books on sics talk of sics and don't take the fear of nucleus drop out of their mind it's it's where that is where the seeds are being sown there and uh, see uh, i am only seeing the okay. results of the bad seeds so <coughs> so the so both, both. I, 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 i am for sics but that that should not take away the credit of peco and when a patient so they are both of, great yeah. techniques and all of us agree to that that they are both great techniques so but yeah, in i india, think is it doing this service to peco is a question yeah. no i do not yeah. think so sir in fact india's great achievements in last 20 years and our fantastic cataract surgical rate and our cataract surgery program which is considered a model all over the world a lot of it is because of manual small incision cataract surgery and we've had uh, dr basavda dr david chang dr bodhi anderson so many people from across the seas accepting that feco is a great surgery without doubt but then well so is small incision surgery and we have to let the surgeon and the patient choose i think we are already running behind time so. uh, no no uh, sir we have one minute rebuttal for ruchi madam as well yeah yeah go ahead madam and she's a great surgeon in both the techniques i mean you've seen her do so many live surgeries <laughs> okay uh, first uh, dr rajshekar i as dr parikshit say i perform live surgery of feco also so please uh, don't uh, misinterpret that the other thing is that you said that sics if they talk about a patient with 612 vision where you want to put a multifocal sir the incision in sics is not 6 mm in all cases You, if your in, uh, nucleus is soft, you can decrease your incision size remarkably to three millimeter, even two millimeter. So, and you can. I always put a foldable lens nowadays in all my SICS cases. So there is no contraindication in decreasing the incision size and giving putting a multifocal in SICS. I think Dr. Ramendra had shared his presentations, and he, I think, regularly puts uh, multifocal IS in all the patients. So one part uh, is there, and the other is. that we don't scare our students to about the nucleus drop in peco emulsification we make them confident to face each and every situation that is it that is what i have been trying to tell you probably your teacher uh, did not make you that confident that is why you are speaking all anyway sir i will not take much time and here you know in a in a uh, panel with full of sics surgeons i think all of them they are yearning to uh, speak uh, in uh, rebuttal so That is it. I think. Thank you, uh, you Ruchi, madam. Uh, thank you. Uh, wonderful uh, debate. Actually, we loved it. And in fact, uh, the both the uh, bo both the speakers they spoke so nicely that you are receiving from their applause heart. from fifty nine countries. So uh, another thing I would like to say is there are more than fifty nine countries who have contributed, who are participating in this the great debate or the Maha debate. And uh, we would like to go quickly to the next comment. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Dr. Wailar sir. Thank you, Ruchi, madam. wonderful wonderful no words to uh, explain beyond that so quickly we'll uh, move on to our next speaker dr lisa park uh, who will be speaking on approach uh, approaching post covid cataract surgery uh, the new york experience and i request dr uh, sahu sir to uh, invite dr lisa park lisa welcome to this great uh, gathering and uh, he is the associate professor in columbia university a complex cataract surgeon and practices in manhattan uh, 
and associated with the director of residency training in new york for 11 years under uh, undergraduate from harvard and postgraduate uh, from uh, i ear and throat hospital and uh, frequently visits africa to serve the poor people lisa please thank you so much can you hear me yep yes yes, yes. I thank you so much to the organizers. This is really a wonderful forum, and I'm just very uh, enthused to hear uh, this great debate. Um, I'm going to change the topic just slightly. Um, as you can hear, I'm from New York, and we have just gone through uh, just a you know major sort of change because of the incidence of COVID. And so uh, I just take this opportunity to share with you. I hope I do not uh, dampen the enthusiasm and uh, of, of the conversation here. But I'll just share with you some of what has been going on for us in New York. As you are very well aware, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 started in China in January and hit our area in the U.S. Uh, at the beginning of March. Um, we saw a great increase in number of cases um, through the middle of April, and now we're on the decline, and we're very happy to say that we're starting to come into our recovery phase, at least for the moment, but you can see the massive amount of impact this has had in uh, the U.S. and particularly in our city. And if you look at the Johns Hopkins dashboard, which changes daily, on the left, you can see the number of cases, which you know you have to take with a grain of salt because of the incidence of testing. But what you cannot deny is the number of global deaths. This is um, numbers from just earlier this week, 400,000. And I think we are actually close to 500,000 at this point. About 25% of them have been in the US. And of the ones in the US, uh, almost 25% of them have been in New York. So for a population in our city of, you know, eight Eight million people in our five boroughs. This was a significant number. And for all of us, none of us have been unaffected and no friends and family and colleagues who have passed away actually from this disease. It's turned a city that usually looks like this into this. And so this is a picture now of current Manhattan. And you can see how our city has been transformed. Um, the uh, implementation of mobile morgues and field hospitals and drastic changes in our medical care has really had an impact on what we've been doing on a daily basis. So we're very fortunate that in January, when the news first came out in China, that our faculty at Columbia had already recruited um, one of the foremost uh, virus uh, scientists, and that is Dr. David Ho, who is a pioneer in the um, disease of AIDS and is responsible primarily for our, um, um, our combination therapy in the treatment of this disease. And so uh, he has been updating us on the basics of what is going on and the latest in research. So I just share with you a few of his slides. So you can see here that this is uh, a picture of the virus. And as we all know, this is an RNA virus virus that's encapsulated and the main uh, infectious agent here is this spike protein. And here is basically the protein that we're talking about, which is a trimer. And here's the receptor bond domain with an N-terminal domain. And I just show you this picture because this just gives us an indication of sort of what are the, the possible therapies that are being now uh, investigated. And we're very fortunate that um, you know, this laboratory is on the forefront of doing that. The, the problem with uh, this virus is that simply it engages ACE2. So here is the mechanism by which um, this causes uh, the problems and disease, and that is interference with angiotensin II. Uh, this is a vital biochemical pathway that regulates uh, processes such as blood pressure and wound healing and inflammation. It's part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And you can see that when the virus binds to ACE2, that it now it prevents this uh, normal regulation and the breakdown, which can control blood pressure and organ damage, this results primarily in then inflammatory disease. These epithelial cells that um, demonstrate ACE2 are all over our body, but the lung is the primary site of injury because of the high numbers of ACE2 that are being expressed in, in the alveoli. And uh, obviously because this virus is then inhaled through respiratory uh, aerosols. And uh, we found that in our hospital that the sickest patients that came uh, obviously had ARDS, um, 
and that they were ventilated at a rate of approximately 30%. So this is 30% of all patients that were hospitalized for this disease. Obviously, the numbers of people that are infected um, are much greater than this, and the vast majority of people uh, suffer relatively minor illness. However, for those that are impacted, we've seen that um, it is not only the impact of the virus, but cytokine storm. And this is a fulminant inflammatory response. So of our hospitalized patients, approximately a third of them suffered acute renal injury and 15% of them required dialysis. Uh, they also suffer from a myriad of cardiovascular complications, including myocarditis, uh, MIs, heart failure, dysrhythmias. And what we were seeing that, um, you know, we thought at first that children were going to escape from this disease, but what we are now seeing is that uh, they are coming to us now in um, the num in hundreds uh, with a Kawasaki-like syndrome, and that is a multi-system inflammatory system. These um, kids are coming, they're actually PCR negative, uh, but they're antibody positive, and many of them have now been uh, hospitalized in our ICUs with multi-organ failure. Luckily, um, the death rate is very low in this population, but it is something that we're going to have to continue to follow. So we're getting very far away from the eye, so I'm returning to the eye. Is this a potential site for infection? And um, we do know from various studies that ACE2 is expressed on the cornea and the conjunctiva. Uh, however, when we look at uh, can we isolate the virus from the eye surface, there are some papers that are coming out, especially from China, that shows that if you swab the conjunctiva, that in very small percentage of patients, you can isolate this virus. Um, you might ask us why, if we had so many patients, why we didn't weren't able to uh, come up with this data. And I will say that we actually attempted to, um, but the viral swabs are flocculated swabs, and actually they became in very, very short supply in our area. And so we were unable to uh, isolate the virus. Uh, but what we do know is that the symptoms and findings in the eye are very um, are not very common actually. I showed to you us, this is my particular institution and our academic center. Our first con confirmed case in New York City uh, hit New York on March 1st, and we closed our clinic the following week. The first death occurred two weeks later. And our um, department and most of the ophthalmologists in the city were actually redeployed. So we were redeployed to medicine to cover for those doctors that were already taking care of patients in the hospital. And so uh, between our faculty, we performed 2,200 telemed visits for uh, hospital employees who are not ill enough to actually go to the hospital, be hospitalized, but who exhibited symptoms and needed screening for testing. And what I can tell you is just anecdotally that uh, almost 0% of those patients had any any kind of eye symptoms and suffered from you know, um, eye problems. We were closed, you can see for a total of uh, you know, almost two months, we opened our clinics again a few weeks ago and just this week we resumed now elective surgery. Of course, during this time, we took care of all of our acute and emergency patients and I'll talk about that in a moment. So what we realize is the goal is uh, flattening the curve by really combating this, um, you know, the respiratory aerosols and performing social distancing and increasing the testing that was available to patients. And so we have shifted our practice now to minimize face-to-face -face contact. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, you know, what we have done to change our practice. So the main thing is to screen out symptomatic patients and even the asymptomatic patient that are showing very early signs. Um, what I can tell you is that although, of course, the flu-like symptoms of cough and sore throat and, and fever and um, shortness of breath are the most um, you know, urgent of cases, that the vast majority of patients showed very mild symptoms, including loss of taste or smell, which is very common, and mild GI symptoms, including diarrhea, and that the fever that they experienced were actually very low grade fevers. So 100 degree fever rather than 101 you know, or over or 38 degrees Celsius. And so what have we done in our clinics? We have now, as we uh, re-enter this new phase, we are limiting face time in our office. This is a, just a diagram of what our, our usual workflow has been and patients come, they register at the front desk, they sit in the waiting room, they see a technician, they go to diagnostic imaging, they sit in a dilation area, then they enter the exam room to see the physician and then they return to the front desk to check out. 
So the first thing we did was to eliminate all the um, pre-examination um, sort of workflow. And that is now all registration, payment for their visit and calls uh, and um, asking of symptoms and why a patient is coming to the clinic is now done by the phone before a patient actually um, comes into our office. We have eliminated our waiting room and patients come directly in one by one and they go directly to diagnostic imaging. All of our, I'm a comprehensive ophthalmologist and all of my patients are now receiving uh, OCTs um, and performing diagnostic imaging first. We then put them directly into an examination room where they are being dilated there um, and I go to see them. And when they finish with their examination, uh, we are actually having our staff enter um, and talking to them, scheduling their next visit. And we do not allow them to actually go out the same way. We have an emergency exit. So we have a, a one unidirectional flow for patients to come in and out of the office. One of the greatest challenges has been the availability of PPE. And so, um, you know, this has been a challenge that we have tried to um, overcome by um, minimizing our usage. However, um, you know, there's no question that this has been what has uh, really been effective in minimizing uh, the contagion. And we, I can tell you that our 40 OR nurses and staff were redeployed directly into the intensive care units with the intubated patients, of them, only two of them got sick and the rest of them actually are coming back serology negative. So we believe that PPE is absolutely effective. And so we have now donned full PPE during our examinations in the clinic. We are wearing N95 masks, but um, conserving them. So we're wearing a surgical mask on top and saving the N95s until they are soiled or uh, ripped. We're also wearing full shields uh, while talking to patients. And for the patients themselves, we are um, giving them masks and gloves as soon as they come into the clinic. And uh, we're trying to minimize the face-to-face -face contact. You can see here, these are the small shield here on the slit lamp is a commercial shield that has come out, but we felt that these were actually too small. So we have engineered a larger shield uh, to uh, bring uh, sort of a barrier between us and the patient. We are also trying to minimize our contact directly with the patient. We are no longer performing applination tonometry unless this is a completely necessary. And when we do so, we are using disposable tips, but the vast majority of our patients are actually just getting a tone of pen um, uh, pressure. We're also utilizing telemedicine to um, screen out patients that don't need to actually come in and see us in the office. And so, um, you know, four weeks before the pandemic hit, we actually went live on Epic, which is our electronic medical record. Um, at the time, everyone was uh, complaining about this transition. And to be perfectly honest, we are all very grateful and glad we were able to accomplish that before this happened because we were able to convert directly to telemedicine quite easily. Um, and what we were doing is we're actually screening out patients with conditions that don't need to be seen in person, conjunctivitis, uh, conjunctival hemorrhage, chalazion. Uh, we're handling them over uh, video. Uh, we are performing no unnecessary refractions in the office and we are utilizing um, online uh, apps such as the eye handbook in order to check vision um, online with a patient. And these are two companies, Visibly and Essilor, that have come up with actually online refraction um, sort of apps that, have, that we are trying out to see whether this can be something that can be utilized in our practice. Uh, okay, so uh, Dr. Lisa, we are, uh, sorry, uh, we are learning short of time. Can you uh, just, uh, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, so just in terms of surgery, we are testing all of our patients by PCR. Um, and a very elegant study has shown that povidone iodine uh, in with live virus um, actually is effective in, in, um, in, uh, in these patients. This is the video uh, that everybody has been talking about that has showed us the phacal plume that is um, relatively lessened through a smaller phacal size and the use of the uh, viscoelastic in order to prevent the flacal plume, which has been relatively effective. And we can show you here that this is what we're doing in our operating room. We're actually covering our microscopes to prevent that focal plume and er any aerosolization. And I just leave you with this, and this is just a video of our cor a cornea colleague um, who was hospitalized for three months, eight weeks intubated, who has been discharged. And so we just hope the best that all will keep safe during this pandemic. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Lisa. Uh, you shared your uh, experience about how they're handling in New York. It's really remarkable. I think uh, most of the countries are already uh, following that and uh, hopefully your people will be the role model to do that. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, we'll uh, go on to the, uh, before the next debate, I request Dr. Naik, sir. Uh, to just make a few comments. Uh, in fact, I'm sorry he had uh, asked me to say a few words of the previous debate. You can go ahead, sir. You can just make your comment. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivas. <laughs> and uh, I'm really thankful to uh, Dr. Lisa for giving us some confidence that, okay, in COVID era also, we can start our practice, ophthalmic practice. But the previous debate means I just a general comment that somehow or other, a environment has been created and the perception that the where the SI, MSICS surgeons are treated as it's the, the probably a stepmotherly treatment. And especially the companies, because there's not much companies uh, advantage in that. So it's never being promoted by any company because all company, if any conference is organized for FACO, there will be a lot of companies who will be willing to sponsor it, but not for the MSICS uh, conferences. And I, I was reminded of, Yes, Dr. Amulya Sahu will definitely remember that. About 10 years back, he wanted to uh, uh, um, organize a conference of MSICS. And that time I said, Dr. Amulya, please don't do this and try to involve also FECO so that you will get some sponsors. So that's how the idea came. And then he came out with a very bright idea of conference of comprehensive cataract surgeons. So one has to be a comprehensive surgeon and should be well conversant with both the techniques so that whenever you have to apply in whichever situation you are free to do that there is no binding on that that you have to by force you have to use only one technique and about the aims was just one comment because Raj Shekhar said very good points but say I'm also from aims but that time there was nothing like FECO so when one of the resident passed out from aims came to my place and started working for some time and when she saw that the MSICS is being done sometimes, and I mean, that time quite frequently also. Then she said, sir, it's such a good surgery, and it was never shown to us in AIMS. So this is how I think we should all train, as Dr. Ruchi Goel is doing, that training for all kinds of surgery and making a complete surgeon rather than only FECO surgeon or MSI surgeon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. So quickly, we'll move on to the uh, next two sets of debates. We have a great debater amongst with us here. You, you can see them smiling both. In my screen, they are appearing side by side. That is uh, none other than Dr. Krishna Prasad. Uh, from, uh, uh, he is the director uh, of training from M.M. Joshi Eye Institute, a pan-ophthalmologist, post-graduated from AIMS. He has special interest in uh, surgical training for the residents. And uh, I would like to say personally that he has a wonderful fan following amongst the postgraduates. Even if he keeps talking, I don't know, uh, till 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, people love to listen to his refraction and much other talks. So with him, we have another fierceful, um, uh, uh, an ever smiling, always approachable and down to earth personality. We have Dr. Partha Biswas who is the chairman scientific of All India Ophthalmic Society, who has born, uh, brought ARC to the very great level. He has trained uh, many, many youngsters, even like me in the LDP. And uh, I think it's, it's over to both of them. It's basically on his industry dumping or selling more and more money and, and uh, you know, taking more and more money by selling these costly lenses like trifocal, pentafocal, I don't know what all to say. Over, over to Dr. Partha first. Thank you very much, Srinivas, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here at this uh, conference, webinar, and uh, so here we are. So to start off, and, uh, and uh, I must welcome my dear friend, my ARC colleague, Dr. Krishna Prashad. And trifocals, multifocals are being dumped, dumped, dumped on us surgeons. Can I believe this or can anybody believe it? It's an absolute no. Who are we to be dumped on? We will be dumping things that we do not want on industry. And I think 
that should be the motto. Now let's look at something. Let's look at this very important question. Which IOL would you prefer for your own cataract surgery? And I think each one of us need to take a call on this. And the results may vary, your opinions may vary, but for me, it's trifocal. It's trifocal if I had to undergo a cataract surgery today, and if I were to choose my lens, and this would be my lens of choice. Now let's look at these two individuals, the well-known faces, the supremos, presidents of AIOS, and both of them. Have you ever seen them with glasses? And do you believe that they do not have presbyopia or never had presbyopia? And even today, I'm sure they are post 60 as well. My pal sir should have been here, I think. And I'm sure they would have got trifocals. For me, getting rid of these glasses were always what I wanted. What I always wanted, LASIK, but it is not for me. And I know now the trifocal has an advantage, a distinct advantage. And if I want to be spectacle free, this is what I want. I want a near vision that is accurate, an intermediate vision for my computer usage and to do my webinars. And of course, I want to see the distance as well. So let's look at these, uh, the advantage of these trifocals in this COVID times as well. A uh, very long range of vision. You don't have to take, put on your glasses. So your, your hands, which might have corona, is not going near your face, your nose, and your mouth. So I think that is a big advantage even today. So it improves the intermediate vision with a specific foci. It does not impair the near and the far vision with the existing diffractive multifocal designs. It favors the distance vision in mesopic conditions, and it provides a range of vision, 33 centimeters to 100 centimeters along with the distance. And it reduces the side effects like night vision problems, glare, and halo. These things were there in the previous multifocal lenses, okay. not anymore. So let us look at uh, a small video clip. And again, uh, I would like to say that uh, this is what I would like to have. Again, if I had to have cataract surgery, I would want Femto. And uh, Femto, they have not dumped Femto on me. I chose Femto with my choice, just like I would cho choose a trifocal, and that's my choice. So I want the best. I want the best. Money is something that has to be considered a little later. But if I have to have technology and the best of technology, I have to have the best that can be offered to me. Money matters. Yes, we can always deal about that. And if Femto is something that is repeatable, I can get a cataract surgery done by done on me by even a junior surgeon because femto trifocal give that advantage of repeatability the techniques are such that can go on and that can be repeated even despite the low skill of a surgeon so here we are we have the advantage of the new technology the better technology and the technology that is yes for today. But let's look at a few figures as well. So we did a small study of uh, around 45 patients and we looked at what the patients felt and we looked at these charts and that is why we have come to a few conclusions. So here we have percent of our patients required spectacle correction for distance and intermediate only 4%, 96% did not. 6% patients needed spectacle to read. That is, 94% did not. And 98% patients answered yes when they would go 
for an implantation of trifocal IOL again and for the other eye. So when we can give the best to our patients, why not use the same technology for ourselves? I am convinced that yes, I am giving the best to my patient and therefore this is the technology for me. Let's look at Professor George Alio and uh, his clinical outcomes of diffractive trifocal intraocular lens. And what he has said that the intermediate and the near vision after cataract surgery with good contrast sensory and improvement of near visual acuity as well. So this is me and this is what I want to be, freedom from glasses. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, awesome. I think uh, no words again. Uh, Dr. KP, you have uh, anything to counter him? Yeah, he is now coming with a big bulldozer. Uh, so what are you coming out with now? Please go ahead, uh, KP, sir. You have six minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Good evening. I recently had a dream in which I just went to heaven and I saw actually a lie meter. A lie meter which is like a clock in which the arms keep rotating whenever somebody tells a lie on this earth. So there were many actually, there were many clocks which represented each person on this earth. There were people, Nobel people, I mean, people of nobility where it hardly moved. There are a lot of politicians' clocks where it was actually moving at very high speed. I wanted to find out where is my friend's Dr. Partha Bishwas clock, lie meter. They said, Dr. Partha? Dr. Partha's clock is in the bedroom of St. Peter. It is actually used as a ceiling fan. Partha, what an innocent face. Such a straight face. You tell so many lies. I can see the troubled conscience in your troubled voice. Okay, wavering. Okay, let me tell you. Every company, every eye company comes out with a presbyopia correcting lens every other day. And they claim some special optical features, and it's a hard sell. They also find that it has its own problems. So they want to sell it, so they persist. Now, you now every IOL needs a KOL. What is KOL? Somebody like Dr. Partha, key opinion leader. So they put a words in the mouth of the KOL, and he convinces the entire community of ophthalmologists that this is the best for everyone. Even he would like to have one in his eye. Okay, even though he's operated. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to say is if you impress vast majority and keep on telling a half lie, it becomes a truth. And they want to create an impression that wearing spectacles for your patient, okay, it's a vintage, it's a stone age practice. And if you prescribe a spectacle to your patient, it's a big sin. Okay, it's a disaster. Whereas it is actually totally different. So we have to take on the goal here. Okay, we are small, you know, ophthalmologists. We cannot fight against this all-consuming passion of using trifocals, multifocal, making these companies richer and richer. He showed some statistics. See, statistics are like swimsuit, you know. What they reveal may be important, but what they conceive is vital. See, please understand this you cannot compare with the thing that David I'm trying to present before you, that it's a monovision. You need to have both eye surgery to enjoy this. Obviously, no study you can compare two patients, I mean, or the same patient having monovision one eye and a trifocal in the other eye. It's just not possible. So let me tell you the problem. It's not just about putting an eye hole in the capsular bag. Everybody can do it. But to put a multifocal or a trifocal, you need to have a pristine cornea. Your cornea should be aberration free. It should not have any opacity, no ocular surface problem. You should have a very strong capsule and a zonule. So you can put it at that point of time. The patient lives for the next 30 years. What happens to his capsule? What happens to his zonules? Any tilt is highly unforgiving. It induces a lot of aberrations, especially any monofocal lens has, is very forgiving for a tilt or a decentration. Not these lenses, my friend. And macula, who can guess what is going to happen to his macula in the next 20, 30 years? And all diabetics can develop CSME, you can develop CME. There are many things that can happen. Once you have a macula problem, 
you are stuck with a disaster that you are going to make things worse. Of all the things the patient side, you are going to buy all the patient problems just by putting a thing. But did you get the money for it? No, the company ran away with the money. You are stuck with the patient. So let me tell you, it's pristine cornea, minimal astigmatism, stable capsular bag, healthy macula, minimal angle kappa, mentally stable patient, emotionally very stoic, and probably someone who demands minimum after spending maximum. I think if you get such patient, Dr. Partha, please send it to me. I'm just still looking for one. Let me tell you, monovision is the panacea. See, I have a lot of experience in monovision. I have done more than 1,000 cases where you have done a micro monovision, very happy patients, many doctors, many ophthalmologists, not wearing glasses. See, proper monovision is one eye metrop, other is minus 2.5, which can even, if patient can read N6, now nobody needs N6 or J5 now. Micro or a mini monovision, where you can make it myopic by minus 1 to 1 1.5, serves most purposes. And looking for an ocular dominance, if you can check the dominant eye and try to make it plano for distance, I think you have all our patients complaining. That is what I want to ask Dr. Partha. So we are going to create like... People may who live in metros, cosmopolitan cities, or people who are Google driven, there may be few patients, but our patients are old. Most of majority live in non-metro places, and they are used to certain I mean, options or certain ideas about their surgery. And they ask for glass prescription. Whenever I do a cataract surgery, they say, when should I come for glasses? Okay, they have no qualms about it. And many patients who we prescribe generously the glasses. I ask them later, they never use it because they're fine because of monovision, 90% of the work, even more is actually done. And most patients in our India, let me just probably reiterate, they have limited visual needs. I know they can be spectacle free. They are already spectacle free with monovision. And whatever extra money that you spend on premium lenses, actually they have been, you know, they, we squeeze the money out of them and they have been fleeced by the companies, but it doesn't have any extra premium to the patients. So it's industry driven. Let us take it straight. It's a sinister plan. Creating that spectacle free vision is a universal need. Everybody has to be off spectacles. It's treated like Corona. Okay, the spectacle is not Corona. See, money to these companies. So the patient gets the patient gives extra money. Money oh. is taken by the company. But you are going to actually by the headache. The patient expects the moon by giving extra money and you are stuck because the patient actually has problem. I met to see a monofocal monovision patient coming and, coming and saying that I am seeing less. But I have lots of patients have actually you know, removed a lot of lenses. We have actually uh, taken out many multifocals earlier okay, for problems. So it's monovision is you, I met to see a patient who complains in monovision and actually, many patients actually are very happy with wearing glasses. And please understand, even monovision is high tech. You need to be extremely precise in your biometry so you can create a mono micro monovision and to get the exact thing. So let us say there's a paradigm shift. Now we don't need anything. Most patients read from the screen. So there is actually need for intermediate vision, which is good with minus 1.5. And it doesn't break the binocular vision. We had actually problems about monovision, about binocular vision. You can have six, I mean, six, six, N6, you can also have, you know, 40 seconds of an arc. That is something that is, uh, you can actually have stereopsis. And the very big thing is the pseudo accommodation. Every emmetropic patient also can see sometimes N10, meaning that there is some spherical aberration, there is some small pupil giving rise to increased depth of focus or is some kind of, okay, a thing acting which actually can have a big factor. So let us say this, trifocal or tri tetrafocal or whatever focal is yet mature. The diffraction problem, the light gets scattered, there's a reduced contrast. See, what is important? Please understand. Let us play the devil's advocate. If Dr. Partha, if you are asked to choose between clarity versus convenience, the clarity of crystal clear vision against the convenience of spectacle independence, as an active ophthalmic surgeon, okay, what will you choose? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, KP sir, we'll ask this question directly as a rebuttal to Dr. Partha. This is the question, Dr. Partha. Okay. Lastly, I would like to probably conclude. If you really have that much of conviction, you replace your Snellel chart in your OPD from Pelleropsin chart. 
let your all trifocal tetrafocal patient let them score 2.1 on earlier ox we this snell chart is 120 years old 100% contrast black and white chart still we are using it because we have no we can we are not there enough to use a pillar option so finally let me tell you clarity is paramount quality of vision is important not spectacle independence minimal photic phenomena most patients are independent from glasses monovision and we have a changing ear vision and let us make some money boss why you want to please the patient give it to the companies let us make money thank you very much uh quickly we'll move on to dr partha yes sir 30 seconds you have whether you want clarity or clearance convenience which one would you like to prefer sir i want clarity i want convenience and we are moving towards that era that gives us convenience and clarity there is no to doubt about it okay he is speaking about covid times covid times where is the possibility of living 20 years i want to live for the moment i want to get rid of these glasses right now for the moment have you heard of something called jugar jugar that's called mix and match uh, lisa uh, i think i'll have to elaborate jugar for you you know lisa mix and match is uh, getting a uh, well there in one eye and uh, uh, 618 in the other eye and all the time the patient does this and this and people like uh, dr krish prasad says no 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 this is the best you have to use both your eyes see distance and near and everything so this is jugar for uh, dr krish prasad now he's taken out many multifocals he's taken out many multifocals you know i still have to see a surgeon who is so terribly against multifocals and the best of technology he in his own practice is that big preacher that yes i am god i am here for the masses and who are these people they speak for Dr. Krishna Prashad, can you identify this gentleman? Yes, with that Modi jacket. So I'm giving a hint. Yes, it is a politician who speaks, and not my ARC leader who I knew so well for last three years. I'm sorry to say. Okay, uh, Dr. K P, you have uh, exactly only thirty seconds, please. Okay. Only I'll tell you two things. Partha means Arjun, Arjuna, and who was the charioteer who guided Partha in the battle of Mahabharat? And number two, clarity. He said, "I doubt the clarity of thoughts. The clarity of speech was excellent, but I doubt the clarity of thoughts." Thank you very much. And sir, in case you want to get rid of your specs, I'm sure there will be so many in this audience who will be happy to do that for you. You just give them a chance. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, actually, the, the this program is just going on and on. It's going just going better on and on because now we have nearly around seven thousand audience with more than sixty five countries participating. I think the the last debate is also a very burning uh, topic. That is whether should we increase or decrease. We have wonderful debaters, Dr. Mahipal sir and Dr. Lalit sir with us, and we have one more esteemed uh, international faculty, Dr. Rodolfo. Uh, who will be speaking about his complex cases for seven minutes, and then we move on to the debate. I request Boramani sir to uh, please introduce uh, Rodolfo. Yeah, Dr. Rodolfo Mastropaska is associate professor of ophthalmology at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, Italy. He has done his ophthalmology from University of Verona, and he was a research fellow at Murfield's Eye Hospital. He has learned his cataract and vitreoretinal surgery from Murfield's Eye Hospital as well as from Bist. Bristol Eye Hospital, UK. So, with this short introduction, I request Dr. Rodolfo to continue with his talk on cataract surgery in difficult case his way. Good evening, everyone, and I would like to thank the all the team and in particular Dr. Amulia for uh, inviting me to this prestigious webinar. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. So, I will speak to you about my way to manage difficult cases. Uh, and what, how much impact this would have on in the COVID era? So first of all, I would like to show you which are the uh, 
which is the data set of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists regarding the risk indicators in cataract surgery. On the right side of the screen, you can see which are the uh, risk factors taking, to, to, taken in account for um, uh, estimating the rate of posterior capsular rupture in cataract surgery. I want to show you this uh, slide because uh, I feel that it is quite important in this COVID era, in this pandemic era, to try to prevent as much as possible and even more than normal any possible complication in cataract surgery. This because uh, our load of patients is dramatically decreased in the pandemic period. Just think that uh, in my center we do uh, up to maximum five cases per day, five, uh, and uh, uh, even in this case, uh, no patients want to really to come because they are scared to get the infection in the hospital. Even if uh, each patient needs to have uh, an oropharyngeal swab before the surgery, but it's quite difficult to find patients. And when you have a patient, if you have a complication, you can imagine how much difficult it could be to find the slot the day after to make a vitrectomy or to take the patient again to theater. So it is important to avoid uh, as much as possible complications. I will focus my talk because of uh, limited time on those type of cataract in which you, we don't have a fundus view because in this type of cases, so you can have a complication more frequently than other cases. So this is the case of brunescent cataracts and white cataracts in which I would advise to perform an ultrasound scan and electrophysiology tests in order to avoid, to, uh, to avoid surprises uh, during surgery and to see which is the functionality and the potential vision of the eye. So some tips regarding the uh, hard rock cataracts. Of course, uh, it is important always to use uh, the blue, to use uh, endothelial friendly viscoelastic and uh, make a large rexis and be sure that the nucleus rotate before starting the fat emulsification. This because uh, we may need to increase the ultrasounds. I have to, to disclose that I mainly do FACO uh, but I think that the two techniques are good uh, in the same way. I mean, the, the results are uh, very similar in terms of vision and, uh, and performance. You, here you can see how you can make the nucleus rotate. And then when you face a very hard cataract, I would advise to make a very nice, white and deep groove in order to achieve a good crack of the nucleus. And then you can combine the, the type of surgery in, in the more comfortable way you prefer. So you can do a stop and chop, an horizontal chop, a vertical chop, or simply a divide and conquer. The important is to have a, a nice side to work. So if you do a fake for hard cataracts, I would advise a larger axis and a, achieving a good rotation of the nucleus. Going on, there are not only brunescent or very hard white cataracts, the white cataracts, that, <coughs> the white cataracts that uh, can be also intumescent. And when you have an intumescent cataract, you have to take into account the possibility of facing an Argentinian flag syndrome. What is an Argentinian flag syndrome? I think everybody of you knows very well. It's due to the increased intracapsular pressure due to the liquefaction of the cortex. And so the pushing out from the from the internal part of the lens, which opens the capsule at the moment of the first incision of the capsular axis. How can you avoid the Argentinian flag? First of all, mandatory is to use Tripa Blue, to use blue to stay the capsule, and then choose the appropriate of a viscoelastic and make a small capsular axis and then enlarge it consequently in order to have a good space. I show you some images. This is a case in which I, I put Tripa Blue, but then I didn't wait enough before removing it. So this is, I think is quite interesting. It was a mistake. Uh, I think that in this case, it's nice to show mistakes and learn from mistakes. I, I removed the blue too early. And then when I was doing the rexis, I didn't have any stain actually. I was doing the capsule rexis as if I didn't stay with the blue. And of course, this increases the risk of losing the rexis and then having complication, even if I didn't have any Argentinian flag. Here you can see, that at a certain point, I just gave up and decided to stain again. But if you stain under viscoelastic, it's not efficient as when you stain uh, the anterior chamber without any viscoelastic material inside. So it, I mean, it, it is for sure less elegant, but also more difficult. In this case, fortunately, I could finish the capsule rests after restaining the, uh, the anterior capsule. Here you can see. 
how you finish it properly. Another another uh, trick is to choose an appropriate PVD uh, OVD. The OVD I use is usually an high molecular weight OVD, and to make a capsule rest is small and then enlarge it, because the the Ar Argentinian flag can happen also in a secondary moment, not only when you perform the first incision on the anterior capsule, but even when you are doing the, the final part of the rectus, you can see this hydrostatic pressure presses and opens, opens the uh, anterior capsule. And then, in, like in this case, you have to finish uh, doing, passing from the accessory access, accessory wound. Um, Another case, of course, we have spoken about FEMTO in this nice webinar, and if you have the possibility, FEMTO is always a good choice, in my opinion, because you avoid all the things that I was just doing you, telling you. With, with, uh, with the FEMTO laser, you can just stain after you do your nice rexis, and you can see that you, you minimize as much as possible the risk of Argentina flag and, and loss of the rexis, and you just go and catch your flap. And then proceed with your fake. So if you have high tech, it's always a good choice. Finally, another white cataract that is def different from the others. Not all the white cataracts comes from uh, the one that I said you until now. This is a traumatic cataract of a patient who had the primary repair and then had in a secondary moment a removal of cataract. Of course, here if you stain with the blue, you cannot see any type of capsule. And so it is, is a tricky case, and I would advise to do it uh, in a VR theater, in a VR list, because the, the risk of drop nucleus is very high, and also the risk of uh, uh, vitreous bulk coming in the anterior channel. Here uh, is quite a soft nucleus, so I removed it with the IA, but then uh, vitreous was coming uh, in the anterior chamber, so I finished the, the removal of cataracts just with the anterior vitrectomy. It was a soft nucleus. Fortunately, there was no, no um, dropped material in the vitreous chamber, but this is just to show that uh, white cataracts can be a, quite a wide range of uh, clinical cases. And uh, uh, we may we have to be prepared to face every type of risk when we face. And of course, be ready to face the worst scenario, but enjoy the difficult. Because if you start a case like this, it means that you like uh, difficult cases. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Rodolfo. Uh, you showed an excellent set of videos, the excellent quality of videos. We really loved watching it. So uh, we'll, we'll have the uh, panel discussion after this last debate. Uh, I think it's the, the mega debate. It's the president versus the vice president of the All India Ophthalmic Society. They both don't need any, any introduction. Uh, uh, they, they, they both are almost like a pitamas in the in the form of ophthalmology and uh, uh, coming from the uh, very reputed center for sight, which is one of the leading uh, eye chain of eye hospitals in India and uh, hopefully abroad as well, my sir. So let's hear from you whether you want to decrease or increase the cataract charges. Patients are suffering. There is economic distress. The COVID has halted everything in the world. So, Mahipal, sir. Yes. Go thank ahead. You. Thank you very much, uh, Shrinivas, and it's a pleasure being here with the International uh, Society for Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgery. And uh, obviously, the debate is uh, should we reduce our cataract surgery charges to make up for the patient's uh, economic distress in the COVID era? Uh, and obviously, uh, you have chosen uh, people from uh, within uh, the same organization to talk for and against. And uh, I'm going to talk about for that, uh, yes, it is a, a good idea to reduce the cost of cataract surgery for the patients. Now, whenever you are having a distress, obviously there is going to be an issue as regards demand. Uh, so the demand would be going down and you have certain things that you need to do. So one important thing is that there is an economic distress, uh, which everybody knows this year is going to have the biggest contraction in the GDP of the entire world. So various figures are being said in the US today, the unemployment rate is about 13, 14% in India, it has skyrocketed. So the problem is uh, the economic distress, uh, which is there. This is one of the reasons that we'll be talking about, but it is not the only reason why I feel that uh, we should reduce the prices. 
Now, whenever you have seen people take a big leap, if you have to jump up or you have to take a long jump, uh, it's always a good idea to step back, uh, to take a bigger leap and to go higher. And this is something very, very important that to move forward, you have to give back. So that is something uh, that we need to do. Obviously, it's a very difficult decision that we have at the present moment. But the answer to the whole thing is, will it make you happy at the end or will it make you unhappy at the end? So therefore, these are the couple of things that I'm going to talk about. Now, obviously, why is it a difficult decision? The first important thing as to why it is difficult is that there is a rise in the cost of surgery. Uh, social distancing has to be maintained. So therefore, the number of patients that you can see or operate have to go down. And the economy of numbers that India actually revels in is no longer going to be available. So this drastic reduction in footfall is a major important thing. And why are we having a reduction in this footfall is because we need safety of the patient and we need safety of the staff. So there is going to be a hesitancy for going in for surgery by the patients. And there has to be, obviously, a possibility of, uh, as you know, there are uh, pay cuts and maybe uh, laying off of staff, etc. And the future is basically uncertain as things stand today. Now, obviously, there is a danger of regulatory compliance and capping that has happened uh, as it is in the state of Maharashtra. Now, what is very, very important is that if you look at estimates, there has been a significant decrease of about several lakhs of elective surgeries that have not been done uh, because of the COVID due to the lockout. And there is going to be further delay that is there. Patients are having limited financial resources. And as you know, in India, the penetration of third party insurance and uh, for uh, healthcare provision by schemes is much lower. So therefore, there is an out of pocket pay that has to be there. Now, the business community has been hit hard. There is an exp uh, increased expenditure due to COVID. Each individual is looking at expenditure that can be avoided or postponed. And once you are looking at avoiding it, there are several studies that have been done across the world where ophthalmology has been hit the maximum as regards any medical field. And therefore, elective medical procedures are coming down. And then let us come to the second factor, that is the fear factor. Patients are obviously apprehensive going out and more so into hospitals because hospitals are seen as hotspots for corona spread. Patients uh, are what is known as nosocomophobia needs to be addressed. Uh, addressed patient needs to be attracted back to the clinic and therefore you have to get the patients and your work coming back. Now, if you look at the blindness that is there, even if we had to reduce the blindness to 0.3% by 2020, we have still not reached the target. And if we err on the side of increasing the charges just now, uh, we are sure that this target will go higher and higher and we will have more and more people going into the blindness. So therefore, you have to not undo the progress that you have made in the blindness control and that's our duty to also keep up the tempo. Now, one important thing is that surgical eye camps are not going to be possible in the very near future. So there are going to be a lot of patients who otherwise would have got this charity surgery or camp surgery, and they would be pushed into this blindness. So what is the option that they have? Obviously, they will come to providers uh, who are for pay. And therefore, these people would otherwise go into blindness if you don't offer them reduced surgery. Now, what I am talking about is not altruism. I am talking about pro-social behavior. An altruistic person will never ever demand everything in turn for what they do for others and put their whole selves in the betterment and well-being of mankind at no cost or even if they have to pay through their own pocket. But a pro-social behavior is an action which is carried out to help someone in need with the intention of an internal or an external reward. So it is not that you are actually spending out of your pocket, but you are just curtailing the profits or you are making somebody else subsidize the thing as it is. Now you have this altruistic, this 12 year old girl who broke her piggy bank uh, to pay 48,000 airfare for three standard migrants in India, or you have Sonu Sood who is in the news uh, that he chartered flights and he has chartered this thing. So this is an altruistic behavior that is there. 
what i am saying is that we need to have a pro social behavior that means that you will reduce your cost or you will reduce your margins but you will bring back the demand so that is something which is very very important that we have to give and that is what we have to receive later now the numbers can sustain the setup what are the numbers that can sustain which will bring in revenue and workload to prevent issuing paint slip so if you are priced very very high and the paying power of the patient is much lower would you be able to sustain the numbers that is there or would you be able to uh, to sustain the organization that you are running and that is what is very very important that we also go to the younger generation that they should remain employed and they should be able to earn their livelihood despite the covid epidemic having occurred the other important thing is that there is the optics versus consequences optics is the way actions and decisions are generally perceived and for those who are in india they would know that the perception as regards healthcare and even in covid is going down with daily media bashing so therefore what is very very important is that this is also a golden opportunity for us to change the public perception the profit motive and patient care there should be an accountability that we should get that because of covid we are reducing the charges and what it will do for you or your practice so this is not an altruistic motive but it is it is a pro social motive and that is that it will keep your inventory moving uh you will have the numbers of the patients coming in and that will generate a demand for the patients to come in for surgery as also what is important is that it will take out the fear out of them for coming into i care centers obviously there will be a little to the operating industry which may or may not go belly up but i think this is the time i heard these debates maybe this is one time where we can be vocal for local that means that you can cut your expenses this is the time when instead of people we switch over to websites just to reduce the cost and this is the time when instead of doing the premium i was really more focused because as learned speaker said sics gives excellent results or good results as much as a femto or a beco does and a monofocal lens gives as much as a trifocal so maybe yes uh, there is going to be a pressure on premium i was that is there this is the time when we should do the jugaad jugaad as uh, partha said which means you are trying to be flexible in your approach by reducing cost you are doing innovation so i think we need to do these innovations and finally i will say as william shakespeare said one more unto the breach dear friends once more that is what we need till we carry out ourselves out of the uh, out of the covid crisis and maybe as we grow older and that's what i feel you will discover that you have two hands one for helping yourself the others for helping others so i think this is the time when we can actually help the community we can help the uh, help our own uh, people who are working with us we can help the industry and we can help recover the demand that thank you very much for thank you maipal sir awesome. that was an uh, excellent excellent talk sir uh, lalit sir there is 14 crore people who lost employment and the salaries were cut for many indian economy lost around 32000 crore that is around 4.5 billion every day in the first 21 days of lockdown and if indian economy was 2.8 trillion only 0.7 trillion was earned so do you think even in this economic distress would you like to increase the uh, distress on the patients by increasing the charges over to lalit sir sir uh, you have to unmute yourself sir uh, okay am i audible now yeah yeah very yes. well and clear sir we are all yes we can hear you sir and okay, more than 7700 uh, people yeah, yeah. are waiting for your reply sir now thank you shrinivas and the entire team of uh, ISMSI for having me here, and this is truly a global uh, kind of webinar going on. And I heard that more than sixty-five, uh, seventy countries, seven thousand viewers. Truly great. Hats off to Amulya Sahu, Boramani, Parikshit, and Shrinivas. You see, I am amused by Bhaypal's statement. Believe me, don't uh, make this a political this thing. President versus vice president, or all these things. 
Maipal himself admitted that uh, he is growing older and he is talking more like a politician that he wants well-being of individuals and a biosocial behavior and 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 help people in need so that they can give. Because I am not bothered for blindness control activities and achieving targets of government of India. I am bothered for my family and my money. Believe me. And the topic is our charges should decrease to make our patients economic distress. What about my economic distress, which I am going through? You see, uh, I am actually surprised, and I doubt uh, Shiva Joshi's motive. Has he deliberately put me into this position, into my boss, who is uh, who is who gives me check? You see, I am actually surprised. Not only surprised, I am shocked. I am shocked because Maipal talking of decrease is unheard of. He talks of decrease only for a purpose of debate. It may be okay, but Maipal talking of decrease, I have never seen for last decades, so many decades. So, with a big namaste to Maipal ji, as well as to all the groups of panelists, I I begin this debate, and believe me, all is uh, well between me and Maipal. and uh, debate is always to bring out the finer points uh, you see both in favor and against the debate is always a fun as we have seen here and uh, so maipal we all know is an excellent surgeon able administrator entrepreneur believe me maipal everybody is looking at you and you guide so many people and the word decrease as i said does not look good from your mouth at all and it believe me therefore i have crossed in the beginning only that you want to decrease you see what's going to happen to everybody you are aware of all these graphs i have taken it from your webinar only which you did for aius you see everybody is affected by economic meltdown this includes uh, countries practices doctors and what shrinivas was saying even though gdp is growing my left toe you see i am also dropping everywhere all the doctors are suffering you see for doctors where does the money come from nobody does charity you go to a tomato shop 10 times he will not do charity for you he will never give you free of cost anything and who is going to give it to us nobody everybody thinks for his own self not for others you see for decrease therefore is unheard of is not possible at all you see number of patients have decreased there is no doubt and this is the maximum you see in your peak time nowadays and then again you talk of decrease pehle hi patient kam hai aur bhi paisa bhi kam kar lo what what is this going on and even in private hospitals if you see, see this uh, saroj hospital and all gangaram hospital everybody has a fixed charge 3 lakh minimum charges irrespective of corona stay and still you talk of decrease you see even even if you go to a store they are started putting safety and hygiene fee there which is equivalent to 1/3 of the total bill this is my bill me and my daughter went there and we have to pay this much extra and you talk of decrease so this does not enter my gray matter maybe i am short of gray matter but this does not enter my gray matter at least and even if you you see once only one day liquor shop is open and there is a special corona fee you have to pay and to you talk of decrease what is this going on you see broadly there are three four categories of patients which all of us see final patients corporate cjhs cjhs and cash and cash you see final patients and cj patient they should be asked to bear all this charge and we should be charging more as far as cash is concerned below poverty line is the only thing i will agree we should helping them we should act, act, go, go to the psych psychological behavior or social helping by social behavior which my father was saying help them in need all this all this which my father can do i but above poverty line believe me people who can pay we should not decrease at all and rather we should increase you see corona times is not a short term game now and things are not going to normalize so fast and we have to live in this new normal and if we decrease where will we go think of our families also you are thinking of other side only emi is rentals etc all go for a six and coupled with reduced income for everybody salary cuts for everybody no increments no appraisal where do we go you are talking of patients you are talking of society so it's a question of our livelihood also 
You see, who pays for all these equipments? Glasses, gowns, masks, face shields, everything costs money. So, dear Mahipaji, Namaste again. And I have a humble request. Who are we to take care of patients' economic distress? Because the title was economic distress of the patient. Are we responsible? Have we created this distress? Are we the only people to help the society in need? Who created all this? You see, why should only doctors subsidize? Uh, does anybody give us subsidy? We tried, AIS tried. How much did you get? Hardly anything. AIS also tried. Doctors are always, always the softest targets. The doctors are still beaten up or thrown away out of the, even residential apartments, they throw out doctors, they will bring in COVID. Salaries are not given to doctors. You see, there was a strike by uh, Gandhi Hospital. Doctors are having pay cuts. They are not being promoted. Appraisals taken a back seat. Not being given adequate PPE. What to talk of other things? Doctors are not provided PPE. And still they are risking their lives. They are the front warriors. Mere lip sympathy and sprinkling of flowers does not help doctors. Believe me, my pal. These utensil clapping and all these things don't help. What is ultimately required is finance and money. And if administrators today solve, want to solve everything, God bless them. You see, believe me, if you, if you start using charges, you are responsible for your own economic distress. And therefore, decrease, decrease does not, does, it cannot happen. And what is likely to happen and should happen is increase only. And with this, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Lalit sir. Now we'll go to the rebuttal by uh, our president, sir. One minute of rebuttal by each. So actually, uh, uh, Lalit missed the point. Uh, there is obviously what I said, He, it's not altruism, it is pro-social. So what is very, very important is that whenever you have to do something, you have to make a strategy. And within the strategy, the issue is that if you have zero patients, you will go belly up. So the issue is to actually keep the tap running. It is not a question of drying up the entire tap and then saying that I am thirsty for water. What is very, very important is that there is going Thank to you. be a reduction in the demand, which is which he has very rightly said. Okay, so uh, were you hearing me earlier? Yeah, 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 yeah. yes, sir. Yeah. Why yeah. don't know somebody yeah. muted? Okay, so basically, what I am trying to say is that this is a temporary measure. Lalit knows me well. You all know me well. I am somebody who always says that whatever is being charged in the city, I will charge ten percent higher than that. That is not the that is not the case. There is a dramatic change in the scenario today where survival is at stake and when there is survival at stake you have to have what is there in the pocket of the customer or the consumer and that is something very very important that if you have to create a demand if you have to survive you have to take out certain things because lalit would always want me to get dark silicon oil and pfcl if instead of that we get uh, arvind oro oro lab uh, pfcl we can reduce the cost and reduce the cost and still make the money so the jugad the indian jugad has to come in maybe this is the time that the indian trifocal which cost one third the price of a trifocal which is an imported one you could possibly do that. And maybe if somebody is wanting a cataract surgery, we can have the SICS done instead of a FACO because you have to change the facts and things like that. So all that I am trying to say from a strategy perspective, thank you very much, Lalit. You told me I am an able administrator. I am a good entrepreneur. People look up upon me. So I think strategically, you are thinking in a very tubular manner in only as uh, Raj Shekhar said uh, something about blind spot, etc. You are not able to enlarge your horizon of thought. The horizon of thought is that if there is has to be a survival for the organization, for the institution and for the staff members, etc., it is mandatory that you have to have patients. You can have a huge setup, but if patients are not coming in for whatever reasons, you will not be able to survive. So this is strategically right, better optics, pro-social, this is something that you have to help the community also at this particular time. 
and keep the keep the uh, keep the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, tap on so that you have some revenue etc to sustain uh, the livelihood of all the people who are working with you so that's all that i have to say he missed the point totally it is not that we are doing charity it is a strategic decision that one has to take for getting the patients back in lalit sir your 1 minute of rebuttal please uh honest honestly i'll speak uh, you see i my part do not have retinitis pigmentosa neither do i have tubular vision uh i believe i am a straight forward man we honestly we have not reduced charges have you reduced charges for your femto you see saying in public forum is something different we have not so my strategy i agree you are a long term strategist i am a very short term strategist i you look for society i look for family you see i have to live i have to sustain my family i have to bear all this cost also you see needy patients believe me will still come although californian cataracts and you know 696s cataracts may not come needy patients will still come and get them operated and believe me they will still pay whatever you because if patient is help they will definitely pay you see you are talking of a society as a whole i am talking of individual needs of a patient patient cannot pay he is poor i will be the first person to cut off his charges decrease the charges but if patient can pay why he should not increase the charge where should i go the patient normally does not come in because he knows what are your charges so uh, as you know uh, center for sight uh, stands for a particular brand a particular charge etc so patient knows your charges so if at this particular moment they know that the charges are pretty high as uh, far as wish to come in in sorry, any case i think you can blame shrinivas joshi for giving me this topic yeah yeah i know that you see that that's <laughs> you, what sir, i'm I saying the last it is going to come on me only i knew as far it as, as far as as far as dor oil and pfc is concerned believe me philosophy of my practice always always has been whatever i do in my eye i do in patient side just just because corona has come i will use uh, or oil that's not my philosophy you see i do not want to use substandard or question not of substandard question is if i am charging so much i give the best possible on my art because this is what i use in my eye i tell the patient ye aapke liye best hai and he will agree for you i think we have dr dr chinmay also dr chinmay can you unmute yeah. yourself dr chinmay <laughs> sahu uh, is uh, he is a vitreoidal surgeon by himself so uh, and also an sics surgeon use, so he can yeah. give us his so would you like to use the oro uh, silicon oil and oro pfo as described by dr mahipal sir or go with the dark one even in this covid era what what are your views on it the oro one works before, pretty well actually before, before chinmay speaks even shrinivas is a retinal has, surgeon chinmay has your retina practice gone down or cataract practice gone down <laughs> obviously sir the cataract practice is down compared to yes. the retina right now yeah. you can so, you can lalit you can never make money out of retina practice That's so true. we we have twenty retina surgeons, big retina surgeons who switched over to cataract. Martha is a shining example. <laughs> <laughs> But what sustained? What what sustained? What sustained well, in COVID time? That is the issue. Guess, yeah, I guess the intravitreals are keeping all of us going actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Wilder sir, you want to make quick comments? You are. Yeah. I know you are smiling from inside and as well as from outside. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead, sir. Actually, the debate was very good and very interesting. uh what my uh, i go with what dr mahipal singh said they were saying because this is a time when you have to modify yourself to go through the storm when there is a storm you can't say that you will have the same size same width and everything it's best is to go through it at the same time what he was saying is not to make losses that's where dr lalit was missing the point actually not to make losses but this is a time when people when their income is less instead of buying 2 kilos they may buy, bring 1 and 1/2 kilos or 1 kilo instead of getting brand a they'll go for brand b this kind of adjustments are happening and he made a very good point of local and uh, vocal for local it's a great thing actually this is a time when we have to look at uh, the thing i think uh, i go with that i go with that it's he, he didn't mean that you just reduce the price and stay blind he said keep reducing price in mind and do every other possible uh, adaptation so that everybody's distress is taken care he 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 was taking care of the distress of staff hospitals everything in fact he was taking care more than what dr lalit was saying lalit's strategy may work for 3 months and fourth month uh, tap may be dry 
So, uh, Dr. Chinmay, you wanted to say something. Uh, I'm sorry. Both of them are my teachers. So, sorry to butt in yes. this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, but as Mahipal sir has uh, rightly mentioned that, uh, you know, this is a time where probably the number of patients coming in might be lesser and creating packages which could be more attractive could make sense. I think this is where uh, MSICS can also come in as sir himself said, you know, I am myself a high volume FACO surgeon. I do a lot of FACO surgeries and I'm well versed with manual small incision cataract surgery. Maybe, you know, getting in the skill of the small incision cataract surgery and reducing the overheads and keeping the packages economical could be a way forward, not only in terms of, you know, making it viable for us, having a reduced you know, carbon footprint as some of the earlier speakers have mentioned and uh, keeping us sustainable for the coming few months to years, I think. Yeah. Just to yeah. make it more interesting, just to make it more interesting, yeah. Maipal, will you now shift to SICS? No, not flats. I'll, I'll have to go someplace uh, uh, without a quarantine to learn it. <laughs> then you, my pulse should do it. Yeah. So I, so I'll, wait, awesome. I'll, wait, I'll wait for that day that my pal is doing SACS and I'll send a video recording to all the members of <laughs> ah, We will appreciate that. Fortunately or uh, unfortunately, my femto percentage has not gone down uh, despite the COVID. Uh, so that's the what event. I said. That's what yeah, I said. I DD I patients know. will pay. You know, but Lalit, the point is that uh, basically you have this to... This was just a debate. Uh, this was just a debate. I wanted, to make, I wanted to make a fun out of it, actually. I, I also the did. Was told me to make it funny, <laughs> therefore I made this. <laughs> So Thank, you was, so Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for So there was a pun intended when I said I'll switch over to SICS. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to that, Dr. Mahipal, sir. Yeah, we will definitely look forward to that, sir. And uh, we'll have another webinar only on that only. How Dr. Mahipal shifted to MSICS. I will send a video. I will send you a video. I will send you a video. <laughs> okay. So any quick comments by Dr. Nayak, sir? And Dr. Hossam later on? I think already I had made my points that basically the somehow or other the ISMS ICS uh, sorry MS, MS ICS has not been given due uh, means whatever it should receive and uh, somehow or other the FACO has been glamorized so much that all others who are not doing FACO and doing this exclusively this only so they are looked upon as something as if oh you are you are untouchable or you are something something where you should not come with us. So this is this the feeling which whatever everyone has should go away and one should have because MSICS is art, is the actual art in performing good surgery. PECO is basically all machine based. So basically there means there the surgeon's role is definitely much less as compared to good MSICS. And, and, and one just comment on, uh, on um, uh, Lalit, that Lalit was today talking more like a politician because here keeping one muffler around the uh, around his neck which is a very identity of a very famous politician in India okay dr Shirinivas, uh, yes, sir. I, yes sir. I, there are uh, uh, places where I would wish to interject in the earlier two debates but since uh, uh, there wasn't time to uh, see what actually happens, what Dr. Nayak said or anybody else uh, says, ultimately consumer is the king. Even when I am saying here, uh, the demand, the consumer would be the king. If the consumer was liking, say, a surgical procedure, an SICS over FACO emulsification, the biggest practitioners would have been SICS surgeons and not, not FACO surgeons or FEMTO surgeons. If you look at the, uh, I'm talking purely on economic success, and I'm also talking on whether it's the president of India or the prime minister of India or a minister or uh, even a big uh, industrialist or a capitalist or even ophthalmologist, how many of them go in for a procedure uh, like an SIS, SICS over uh, FACO? Uh, what is very, very important, SICS is a great uh, procedure. It is doing a lot of good work for a particular uh, subset of patients, etc. But consumer ultimately would also decide in the earlier debate that was there, which is the trifocal versus the monofocal. If we were talking about earlier lenses, which were not good, but now you are getting great lenses and therefore now people are coming and actually demanding trifocal lenses. So you cannot fool the consumer 
you cannot make certain claims or non claims which do not function so you cannot be continuously telling a lie and the consumer will be falling for that the consumer wants a topical surgery consumer wants no astigmatism goes goes and plays golf as early as possible gets the best crisp vision etc and the consumer actually knows which uh, which gives you more uh, satisfaction and that is why when you look at high end patients they would all go in for phaco emulsification or mics i have yet to dr ravindra obviously has claims of a lot of great patients coming but i have yet to see a top notch guy going in for an sics surgery even after reading the entire net and doing all the research etc etc Uh, I have, I am sure I may be wrong, but I think within, uh, uh, say, an Arvind Eye Care system, if an ophthalmologist comes for a surgery, or if he comes to me, would I offer an SICS? Or even if David Chang is there, if he has a top guy who wants to come in for a surgery with a regular normal cataract, we are not talking about uh, difficult situations where uh, SICS is in the, uh, this thing. Would he do a phaco emulsification or an SICS? So the consumer ultimately, even in the present situation, would be the king that he would. be actually driving the prices for at least the next one or two years uh, till we get out of this long recession that we are all uh, expecting okay. but can i can i can i come in can i can i make a comment yes sir. can i come yes, in sir. yeah you yes, uh, uh, maipal very rightly said in today yes, sir, sir. consumer consumer will go with dr lalit and then dr awesome so consumer yeah, there is no doubt but yeah. believe me believe me i feel it is the marketing companies which are Become richer and they are the kings. Believe me, consumer goes by whatever doctor or the counselor explains to them. So whatever doctor will tell them or counselor will tell them, patient wants vision back, and so therefore, in this uh, you know uh, debate, it is the marketing companies which are becoming richer and they are the kings and they are the decision makers. Can, can I can uh, I come yes, in? Yes, sir. Quickly, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, my pal, uh, please uh, make a survey. as a president of aios and see how many uh, uh, top uh, sics surgeon how much they are earning it is a, your perception but have a survey proper survey now yeah. that we have brought into sics to a level where even our friend you have you heard the name that uh, you know software based uh, uh, sics surgery there we are giving bifocal with monofocal iol and we have brought uh, sics to a level where it will be prestigious all over the world so i it is time that si uh, aios does a survey and standardization and finds out how much my friend uh, raut is charging 2 lakhs for the cataract surgery and he has the, all the big guns going to him for sics surgery he does only sics you can go and see his opd is like a uh, marketplace and he does all the Uh, uh, Rajiv Dr. Dr. Rajiv Rao, sir, Dr. Rajiv uh, Rao, including uh, I think uh, Mr. Bajaj is also his uh, his patient as well. It charges are highest in India for cataract okay. surgery for SSS so, with monofocal. So it depends uh, upon your patient. We don't know my sir's charges. That is why you are saying his charges are. I have access to a lot of balance sheets of doctors. I don't because of NDAs. I won't disclose that. So I have uh, I I have access to a lot of balance sheets for uh, various uh, things that uh, we have approached. So let's uh, I I wouldn't want to say anything more than that. But uh, if you look, you maybe you have given us one name uh, for example. But uh, the average uh, ticket size of uh, Dr. K K Mehta's surgery or my surgery is uh, about ninety thousand. That's okay. the average ticket size. So that uh, basically I think making one an exception never makes a rule. and if you look at uh, any of the big uh, uh, overall enterprises whether you look at agarwal you look at asg you look at center for sight you look at maxi vision uh, you look at iq you look at uh, any uh, i'm talking from a pure pure corporate point of view uh, all of them are pure fakos none of them do sics and they have turnovers from anywhere from 500 crores to maybe 100 crore so that's the turnover that they have so i don't know how many sics surgeons have that kind of a, a turnover that, that they have so that, uh, i maybe you have given me one name i am not aware of arvind eye care system would be having arvind eye care is an ngo sir arvind eye care is an ngo and they are doing more if you read their report i will send you their report there is nobody from arvind the number of phaco emulsifications is increasing for all their or for all their paid patients they are doing the phaco emulsification and it is not uh, sics that is being done that is done for the camp patients and just one question one thing about this service i think what is very very important is that 
when a person even from arvind i care when the person comes out doing his dnb or masters that person has got only 10 fake oil emulsifications to be done that i feel is a disservice that is being done because then they want them to come back again to learn fake oil emulsification uh, i think rohan is nodding is that very well so that is the problem today even a person who has done 400 500 sics at arvind i care would come out doing only 10 15 fake oil emulsification that is the kind of disservice that is being done had that person be trained for 200 fake oils and 200 sics then he would not be going from pillar to post again to come back and learn fake oil emulsification because if he has to be successful in practice he has to be a good fake oil surgeon so that okay. is the, that is the kind of disservice that is being done that fake oil is not being taught in mass uh, areas where mass surgeries are being done it should not be excluded as a teaching thing yes i have never learned fake oil because from ecc we went straight on to fake oil and sic has never used to be there it it came on later than fake oil emulsification but if you have to do a service to ophthalmologist in india fake oil should be taught equally as sics in all these uh, ngo organizations uh, quickly uh, boramani sir uh, you have raised your hands you want to make quick comments No, no, Doctor Sahu has also only uh, covered it. Okay, uh, I think Doctor Hasan wants to uh, wants just to make a say something. Right? Yeah, Doctor Hasan. Yeah. Okay, okay, my 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 uh, uh, all my dear colleagues and uh, friends, thank you for inviting me for this extremely super talks and debates and discussions as well. We are learning from all of you all the time. But uh, uh, I'm thanking my my dear uh, friend, Doctor Larit. He is loving our voice about the the income dropout, <laughs> and and, and uh, I hope for you to uh, to to sleep this time this this night in your bed, not to be taken to any way. <laughs> okay, uh, quickly, uh, Doctor Rodolfo. Uh, 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 I, I will I will I will complete another point. Uh, yeah. I think I think the only conflict in the era of COVID nineteen about the 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 difference between the FACO and the, the MCICS after. Uh, what has been cho- shown by with Dr. David and Dr. R- Rodolfo about the the difficult cases how to to do with with either te- with with both techniques? I think there is no conflict uh, in, in re- as regard to the COVID-19. Uh, I mean that just the the conflict could be considered in the era or the or the concept of the bilateral simultaneous. Uh, FICO surgery or MCICS surgery, as uh, shown by um, uh, Dr. Steve, this is this what will be regarded in the era of COVID-19 because of this the sake of time, the sake of visits, the sake of of the the fear of the people uh, from the diff- the frequent visits, the frequent uh, operations, and so. But about the the both techniques, I don't think there is difference between both. Uh, As regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hassam. Uh, quickly, Dr. Rodolfo, what do you think about the the charges in the Italy? What is happening there? Uh, in Italy, is is free, so there is no matter of charges. So uh, the government is paying uh, everything, and uh, yeah, yes. I think the same same is that in even in Toronto and Canada as well, Dr. Steve. You have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, that's, that's not quite true. In Canada, we have a very uh, peculiar system. Healthcare is free, but nothing that has any component of refractive surgery is free. So, if we want to put in a different kind of lens or correct astigmatism or myriad things, use an IOL master. It's not covered. Uh, and what I said to you at the end of my talk, and what you've heard from Dr. Mahi Pal and others indirectly, is the same thing. When you give patients choice and there's any amount of money changing hands, you will see that you're going to go from extra cap to small incision, cataract surgery to FACO and to femto, as has happened in Canada. My patients now have a choice coming to me of getting free surgery, or of paying partially for some refractive surgery, or getting femtos. And I thought no one would ever want to have a femto, and now they come in asking for femto, and more than half my cases now are femtos, and I thought they wouldn't want to pay, but In a country where healthcare can be free, they're happy to pay because they perceive it as better. And in reality, I began doing femtos primarily for people that had uh, a lens with phacodinesis, where I thought it would move and wasn't stable, or a, a black cataract, 
because if you take a black cataract, as long as you can see the retina uh, in, in any manner, you can easily do a black cataract with a femto, and it becomes like a two plus cataract surgery. You, you break up the lens in a thousand little pieces and it becomes easy. And so cases that perhaps you were doing manual small incision cataract surgery for because you felt that FACO could be difficult, they become easy. And so I tell patients when they come in and ask me for a FACO, if they have a four plus dense cataract, I say, look, you should do FEMTO unless you're crazy because the risk is much, much lower. And it takes maybe a minute more than a, a, a FACO on a 20, 30 cataract and they come out just fine. And the same thing will happen in India as happened in Canada. Even with government support in Canada, patients will choose to do what they think is better for themselves. As, as Mahipal said, in the end, the patient is the one who decides. And they, they allot where their money goes to. And I tell my patients, you know, here's your choice. Do you want to buy three nice color televisions or do you want to fix your eye better? Without a good eye, you can't see your color television anyway. So you might as well fix your eye and worry about your TV later. Uh, and that's reality. And, and as India becomes economically successful, which it has amazingly in the past 30 years I've been going there, the same thing has happened in India. I see the same changes has happened here. You're just about 10 years behind because you know America and Canada are wealthier. Okay, so uh, quickly with Dr. Rohan, uh, coming to you, what's the situation in the UK? So I, I'm sure that majority again are uh, the insurance based. Well, uh, as, as you know, most of it is um, uh, the public energy system, which is a similar system to Canada. The only um, the difference or the subtle differences which have been recently introduced, and by recently, I mean maybe in the last couple of years, is um, uh, the allowance of toric lenses. That they allow people who have more than three types of astigmatism to be eligible to get a free toric lens. But uh, as uh, Dr. Ashno said, uh, multifocals and uh, uh, those who need a more refractive outcome would have to look at private options. The, the only, um, the flip side of it is uh, a lot of it has to do with the kind of training that is done in the UK. Surgeons simply do not know uh, how to perform an uh, MSICS. Uh, a lot of surgeons simply even do not know how to perform uh, extracapsulars. With the recent uh, training, maybe the last decade of surgeons, if they find a complicated case, which they find that they would struggle or potentially struggle with the fake uh, interestingly because of the system the the cases are given back to a, a retinal surgeon so which retinal surgeon performs the cataract either with the neck or a fake because they anticipate uh, because the, the case is anticipated to be more complicated so i think a lot of it depends upon how healthcare works in the country and also yeah. the kind of training yeah i agree i think it's a uh, depends on each country how they have uh, because in india most of it is private and less of it is uh, government and uh, let's go quickly uh, to dr parta sir uh, quick comments uh, so what have you done have you increased or decreased your charges in bbi foundation you have to unmute yourself sir we have kept the charges the same and uh, we refuse no patients for charges. I mean, we did it in the past also, right now also we'll do. And in the future also, we refuse nobody for charges. Our okay. charges are pretty high on the upper segment and very low on the lower segment. And that's how the group practice is working. And I think group practice again is one of the best potential practices that as of now, the COVID has taught us that we need to be together, grow together. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madhu. You gave a wonderful talk on the carbon footprint uh, in the operating room and how it is increasing. So you are more towards recyclable and reusable. So do you think that uh, by using this, as Lalit sir said, the PPE and all the costs keeps on adding up more and more, but since you are using recyclable, so have you uh, increased or decreased your charges at Kakinada and Sri Kirana Institute? Right now, uh, we did not officially decrease, but whoever are not able to pay, they are giving a 10% off just to make sure that they come in. Like we don't want to lose those cases as Mahipal sir has told. So somebody is thinking about not getting the surgery done immediately. Telling right now we are having an offer. You can get the discount of 10% if you are willing to get the surgery done now. Okay. Just to keep the thing going. Great. Parikshit, sir, last comments. 
I think it was a wonderful seminar with speakers from so many different continents and we have to thank uh, Dr. Srinivas, our young and enthusiastic secretary, for moderating it all. So, thank you. Thank you. Shrinivas, uh, uh, this is the best ever webinar organized and thanks to this team of International Society of uh, Manual SICS. So many, you still I saw figures more than 8,000 at this moment. It's 1049 at this moment, and uh, still uh, you see people are logged up. So hats off to you, to Parikshit, to Boramani, to all the office bearers, Sahu, Dr. Nayak, so many of uh, you who have uh, you know steered this uh, society despite despite so many hours. Great, thank you, Dr. Thank Boni. You. Your last comments. Let me just unmute myself. You know. I I really want to express my my thanks to everybody involved and especially sir during this really difficult time for everybody and especially for those folks in india we're all watching i know that um your peak may be coming up so our thoughts and prayers are with you all there as well thank you uh dr lisa Thank you so much. It was just really inspiring to hear from everybody and I'm just honored to participate. I look forward to joining you again in the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. David, Dr. Chang. Uh, yes, I just want to add, uh, uh, you know, this is the one thing that's coming out of the pandemic is these virtual seminars that bring us all together from around the world, even though it's very early in California. Um, but uh, congrats to uh, everyone for continuing to think about education and about helping each other as we individually cope with uh, COVID. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Weiler, sir, last comment. You have to unmute, sir, unmute. This is one of the best uh, webinars I have attended. And not only me, so many people, holding on to people for three to four hours is not easy. And we had excellent speakers and a lot of learnings. I learned, I learned a lot. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, sir. Last comment, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amali Sahu and Dr. Srinivas. And I will again repeat the same comment which, uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, just now he said, that this is because I never sit for any, any webinar for so long and I am always against any long webinar more than 90 minutes. But this is going to be four hours and I am still there on. And oh, one, thing I wanted to, one thing I wanted to point out to <laughs> just about the debate about Partha and, and uh, KP, that one are very high volume, high-end cataract surgery. I will not tell you the city and the name of the doctor. And then recently, it was recently, it was about three years back, we saw him, he said, do you know, I have got my eyes operated. I said, oh, very happy. So that's good. And then I said, you're not using glasses. Then I thought he must be because he's using a lot of multifocal lenses. So must be, must have got multifocal in his eye. So I said, what have you got inside your eye? He said, monovision. Mono monovision. Mono yeah. So that probably that tells us everything. Okay. Yes. Th thank you, sir. Maipal, sir, last uh, your last comment, please. I think maybe you could ask uh, Dr. Susan also, but anyway, uh, I am really happy to participate uh, being with the uh, uh, Manual Small Incision Group. It's always a pleasure and I love uh, uh, to give my point of view in this uh, heavily loaded SICS group. Uh, don't hate me for that, but uh, I do stick on to certain things that I feel correct. But I think it's wonderful, uh, lively debates, and uh, I think international faculty was great. So was the national, and I think you guys uh, arranged it pretty well. And I would like to echo what uh, David Chang said, that I think uh, what is important is that uh, we are keeping the education going on. Uh, we are uh, involving the ophthalmology. It's obviously a very, very... Uh, uh, difficult time and instead of going into a state of depression etc i think this keeps the morale high and it keeps the teaching and education going uh, uh, going up and i think uh, we are connecting like never before with international audience and international speakers so i think uh, the new normal yeah. at least i would say this is a positive that's come out of the new normal and maybe webinars uh, and saving money as all of us want to uh, on conferences maybe the next uh, uh, new normal partha apologies to you but uh, maybe webinar uh, <laughs> might uh, be something that might replace uh, physical conferencing uh, over the next couple of months or maybe a year or something but great show and uh, thank you very much for having me thank you sir i, I we have thank another you. eminent faculty dr susan 
Uh, you want to make your last comments, please? Is she there? I am. I am. Hello. Yeah, yeah, here? yeah, yeah. Please, please, madam, go ahead. Okay. I would like to say this is the absolute best educational uh, four hours I've spent in my entire life to see all of you so passionate about de uh, delivering care to your patients. And I want to um, recommend that we listen to what David Chang said and also to Professor Sanchez that many of us didn't learn SICS. And so we have been pushing for FACO because you know, that is what the companies are actually encouraging us to do. And I love to see so many of you that are just bucking the system and putting our patients first. And I'm so excited that um, I had the opportunity to be with you all today. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I think we come to the end. Dr. Steve, you uh, anything you want to add? Or you... Yeah, you... <laughs> First, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. I've been really impressed that these webinars that originate from India seem to be the ones that draw the greatest crowds around the world, and over 8,000 is incredible. I don't think any of us have ever spoken to a medical audience at a meeting with 8,000 people in an audience. Uh, it's, it's really very impressive, and, and it's interesting how passionate you all are. I'm starting to realize how old I am, because I actually never learned FACO or M6 as a resident. I learned intracapsular surgery. So uh, I think we all have to be prepared to change and move with the times. And I've had experience in my life of doing intracapsular surgery, of doing extracapsular surgery, of doing some small incision uh, extra caps of doing uh, FACOs and now FEMTOs and mixtures of all of them in different complicated cases. And I think that's just part of life. And it's unfortunate that residents don't get a chance to learn a wide variety of techniques because you never know when you're going to need them. And I thank okay. your association for being so open to having a, a discussion with all of us pushing different points of view from the things that we happen to favor at the present time. But I think, as you've all said, all the techniques are used in different cases and good to know. It's been a great, great pleasure and honor to be included. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Do you raise your hands? Last comment, please. Yeah, okay. I, I just, uh, uh, I'd like to say at the end, after these old webinars, we have to, uh, to make a deal between the FACO surgeon and the MCICS surgeon to be a friend, not to be a debater at the end. Uh, uh, yeah, stop, stop blocking. <laughs> Stop blocking with the. They, they, were, they were all excellent debaters. Yeah. That's why we chose them. <laughs> yeah, nothing okay. personal in we, this. Uh, nothing emotional in this. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, it okay. was. It was purely like how do you have the disclaimers in the film that the characters yeah. are all fictitious and all. Here, some of the personal comments are all fictitious. So nothing personal to be carried. They are yeah. excellent debaters. We really I, love this I session. Mean, yeah. I mean, I mean that the cute face of the FACO stop looking at the MCICS as a bloody face. And for my dear friend Bonnie Henderson, he's, she said at the at the start that she is nervous. Just just is calm FACO surgeon, but nervous MCIC surgeon. I think you are now a braver and uh, uh, calmer with the MCICS, right? Sahusar <laughs> is all smiling here. Sahusar and Boramani sir are all smiling here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassam, for that wonderful comments. Last comment from Dr. Ravindra sir. You, you, you disappeared in between. I, I'm sure that you had a nice food and we are all still hungry, sir. No, 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 no. I didn't disappear. I was here throughout. I heard okay, just joking. comment that was made. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. So from the, my heart of heart, I've done everything. I'm from All India Institute. I had the greatest teachers. I've tried everything in cataract surgery. At the end of it, I would still say, I would invite Dr. Mahipal to my institution, stay with mm -hmm. me as my guest for one day, and I'll ensure that you change your mind. Sure. So am I, okay. yeah, M6 <laughs> is a great surgery. You'll be the greatest surgeon because uh, your hands are utilized instead of the machine. My fingers are utilized instead of command from my, my head going into the foot and then going to the machine and then it learning. It's, it's a direct communication between the eye and my fingers. So I enjoy doing SICS. Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I think Doctor, you stop the quarantine for people coming from Delhi, then I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think Dr. Chang was raising his hand. Uh, yes, Dr. Chang? No. Okay. Fine. I think uh, we come to the end. Dr. Boramani, sir, Dr. Sahu, sir, uh, final anything? First, we you... thank, thank everybody for a wonderful, and thank yeah. uh, the moderator. You've done a wonderful job, sir. 
thank you sir thank you it was yes boram sir it was a wonderful job yeah with yeah. lot of international yeah. and national yeah. faculties and the attendance is 8500 it is almost like yeah, we'll see. Uh, how many one countries in one yes just across seven you know yeah good so we'll have more updates on the group i think by tomorrow we'll get more updates and then you can quit the whatsapp group by we come to the end of this session the planet i think has come to know a little bit about it if not much and that's how the name goes the planet wants to know thank you everyone uh, thank you debaters thank you panelists uh, thank you audience viewers from more than 65 countries who have made this program a great success so looking forward to all your involvement in many such programs in future thank you very much thank you everyone have a good night thank you chochi and team including raman rohit beslin they have done a really wonderful job thank you thank you very much for that thank you good night thank you very much bye david okay. bye bunny bye, bye. bye steve